Just a bloke in a bar. What is up, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome to another episode of Bloke in a Bar. And do not forget, 6 p.m. tonight, New South Wales time, one of our biggest drops ever. Something that we've never done before. It is the perfect Christmas present. We've been working on these for ages. The material we use, we've got to give a shout out to our uh, an old employee. He's not with us anymore. He actually left quite a while ago. However, Cam, the material that he got for these are seriously the best you can get. I cannot express enough. And he went, he did so much research into finding the best material. So a massive shout out to Cam who uh, got that done for us years ago. But that's how long these have been in the making. We're only doing it now when years and years has been in the making of making sure we get it right. Uh, so cannot wait, 6 p.m. tonight, New South Wales time. One of our biggest drops ever. Hope you guys like what uh, we're dropping. Boys, Guru, how was the weekend? It's good, mate. Pretty quiet for me. I saw uh, you got stuck around some candles. Talk to me. Yeah, uh, candles. Bloody um, went to candle concert, can, concerts by candlelight or something like mm-hmm. that. I want to be a, viol- a violin player. What, <laughs> How do you, how do you, look, how do you hold it? (laughs) (laughs) That's what it looked like. If you listen to this on Spotify or or Apple, do yourself a favour, jump onto YouTube. (laughs) That's why I walked out saying, I want to be a violin player. Just the passion, baby. And they they like stamp to the beat and that. Like some like I'm a creative kind of guy, Guru. Where was that? <laughs> uh, in the city. In the city. How many people are in that room? Um, um, I don't know. Maybe two, three hundred. Maybe. Yeah. Okay. Maybe. Well, what was the theme of it for the listeners? Lord of the Rings and Game of Thrones. I tell you what, <laughs> Lord of the Rings still hits, baby. It still hits. Like got, Game of Thrones is good, especially when you hear the intro song for sure. But when Lord of the Rings, The Hobbit, the Shire song mm-hmm. comes on, it does. It doesn't get much better, Ru. It doesn't get much better. That's yeah, good gear. Um. Timmy, how was your weekend, mate? It was good. Yeah, summer's here, mate. Mm-hmm. Life's good. Yeah. Got the golf bug, so plenty of golfing on the weekend. Pretty cruisy one, but uh, I'm good. Yeah, Ready? wow, okay. <laughs> sounds, you- sounds heaps exciting. He slapped me around the golf course <laughs> last Monday. Yeah, I, I did slap Rory around last Monday. <laughs> Guys, don't forget to like and subscribe on all platforms. Leave us a comment, YouTube and Spotify. And also don't forget on YouTube, you leave a comment, Beaks Bag each week. We give you a $50 bloke voucher if we choose your question. And, uh, and there's a lot of people that watch the show or listen to the show that haven't subscribed to either Spotify or YouTube. Make sure to hit that subscribe button and that like button. We really appreciate it. And also leave a positive review if you can. We'd really appreciate that as well. Um, Don't forget, guys, Grumpy Coffee is now fully back in swing. The ground coffee should be back soon, but pods are back. Pods are back. Beans are back. Head to the website. Grab your Grumpy Coffee, the best coffee in all the land. You know what's funny? Even some of the reviews, we only got one or two that that weren't positive. They were one-star reviews. They even say in those reviews that the coffee tastes bloody good. It just took too long to get to me, which I understand. I get it. But so even in the bad reviews, it says the coffee is unbelievable. Uh, so that's on me, baby. That's on me. That's, uh, we, didn't, we weren't prepared for the amount of people that uh, purchased Grump, Grumpy Coffee, but we're back up. We're good to go. The beans, the pods, grab them. They're the best in the business, guys. Grumpy Coffee. Turn that frown upside down, baby. Turn it upside down. All righty. Let's face some music brought to you by Sportsbet. Okay. Hammy's not here, uh, but... Uh, we chose whatever we wanted, wanted this week. So, Hammy, he went New Zealand to beat England uh, in the second test. Lost. Now, it says I copied Hammy, but I was actually going to say New Zealand was going to beat them anyway. I said 13 plus, but it lost, whatever. You know, it, it is what it is. Sometimes even the best of us uh, get things wrong. Guru, same game multi. Baltimore to beat the Ravens. Tick. Quinton Johnson to score. Eh. Derek Henry to score. Eh. Lost. Just uh, for a bit of context, uh, last week was week 12. It was the first week Derek Henry hadn't scored this season. <laughs> Quinton Johnson had five balls thrown at him, dropped them all, and he turned into a meme last week. So I really put the mocker on the boys. Yep, that's what. That's a roo curse, baby. That's a roos. Uh, Timmy, Lady Laguna to win, lost. Maddie Liberal to beat Man City, win. So Maddie only won to get a point this week. Wow. That is... That is uh, mm. I don't know if we'll pay that, if I'm being honest. Does soccer count? It's a peak off season. Yeah, peak soccer. Also, Liverpool going into that red-hot favourite. Yeah. Man City, uh, Man City have won five of the last six 
Premier Leagues. Yeah, but they've lost they're, five they're games on the, in a row. Yeah, yeah, that's why I picked them at $2.20. It's yeah. good betting. Uh, Look, I, I don't think... I th- You know what? Minus one. You lose this week. Uh, <laughs> Lame bet. <laughs> <laughs> that's brought to you by our friends over at Sportsbet. Give us a follow that's on... That's just utter nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> give us a follow on the feed, guys. Uh, plenty of putting going on each week. And you can basically... You just give us a follow. You, get, you go do the feed option. Type in Denon or Bloke. It comes up. Boom. Press feed. A, it's a good way to show Sportsbet that the Bloke community gets around us. But also, you get to see what I'm putting on. What I'm putting on, baby. I tell you what I'm... It's not really putting, but I'm, I'm putting my good time on. Path of Exile 2 is coming out this weekend, boys. December 2nd, Path of Exile 2. Now, Ru, I know you're a big Path of Exile guy. <laughs> it's an action RPG. Uh, look, it's... <coughs> that it's, helped me. Yeah, it's an action RPG. Now, a lot of people would call it a Diablo-like. However, the yarn is, is that Path of Exile 2 was actually created... You know, after Path of after Diablo 2. Diablo 2 is a classic game. Um, and so what happened, Rue, is Diablo 3 was made. Mm. And they went away from the dark, gritty nature of Diablo 2. And a lot of people were yearning for the Diablo 2 to continue down that route. And so some lovely gentlemen over in New Zealand called Grinding Gear Games, they created their own game called Path of Exile, which is closer to Diablo, Diablo 2 than Diablo 3 and 4 is. Anyway, so now Path of Exile for the last 10 years has been growing and growing and growing. Now, Diablo, worth billions of dollars, worth billions of dollars. Mm. However, this small, tiny game studio in New Zealand is about to conquer the large Blizzard Entertainment. That's one of the biggest video gaming uh, companies in the world. And this Path of Exile 2 is coming out this weekend, early access, still not fully out yet. And it's about to be monumentous, Saru. The Diablo was my first ever cricket bat I had. Shout out to Dan. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yes, that I've is heard, so good. I've heard Cam, the, the gameplay in that series is pretty shoddy. <laughs> <laughs> shoddy. It's like literally the best thing about it in this game. Well, don't shoot the messenger, okay, okay. I'm just reading reviews here. It's like gameplay shoddy. <laughs> Path of Exile 2 is not out yet. Well... <laughs> It's going to be shoddy, so <laughs> spoiler alert. There you go, spoiler alert. Gamers, Timmy, has, he's put the good word in. Um, anyway, guys, let's get, let's get to a hungry player. <laughs> and after the weekend, I'll tell you what. After the weekend, there's only one man that could be the hungriest player. Hungriest career, hungriest whatever you want. It is the great Fatty Vorton. That's right. Fatty Vorton has retired from his role in media at Channel 9. He is our hungriest player. Use code FATTY, F-A-T-T-Y. For $7 off Italian, minimum spend is $20. And boys, I want to go around and I'll start with our favourite fatty moments. First of all, Icon, as you can see behind you, one of the blokes that laid the foundation in media. Uh, We have to, obviously his career is incredible by itself, but think about the impact this bloke's had. If you just had his career, he'd be, you know, remembered as one of the best. But then also, and that's not even just in, you know, he's also got his coaching career. We all, the famous um, Origin uh, series but also to impact media because before him there was essentially no ex-players that were going to media to do what he did and be in media this long when you see people resold pretty much yearly it, it, there's an argument he made his media career is even bigger than his playing and coaching career which is freaking amazing so the great fatty we wouldn't be here without fatty and what he did early on he's a guy that laid the foundation one of my favorite moments and it's all over the internet a lot of people posting favorite moments but it's got to be one of the days where uh they had the fan come up and just pestering him all day and uh just seeing fatty's natural reaction of trying to be polite to this guy <laughs> but also ready to throw down at a drop of a hat the on oh. it's gonna be an atrocity here <laughs> soon. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love that kind of stuff because what I I love the fact that you know yeah he's a little bit older but he's still fatty he, he'd be able to go with the best of them and this bloke is pestering him he's trying you can see his anger levels just rising and rising and what I it makes the clip even better especially watching it now is seeing a young Maddie Johns like that's not the Maddie that he is now mm. almost like awkwardly oh yeah what's going on here but he's obviously in on the joke anyway that's one of my favorite moments i love seeing uh pranks like that especially pranks that i think sometimes now because everyone's aware of it you can tell they're aware something's not right in this prank he absolutely had no idea what was going on that's one of my favorite fatty moments it's funny when you look back on the you know where, where, where the show was and who maddie johns is now that fatty sort of took him under his wing yeah for sure and it's and you know when, when you think about when Vorton eventually left like they went and got other people to join the show that even at that point probably Matty Johns wasn't ready to be that guy mm-hmm. you think about now in my opinion Matty's going to be the goat of yeah probably rugby league uh um, it's an interesting history with the on. footy show because even back then this is I think 2014 Matty Johns was like 
he creatively wanted to take it in a different direction. Mm. And it's like, you always wonder what if they had have gone, yeah, let's go this way yep. instead of that way. Cause mm. obviously it's not with us anymore, but yeah. yeah. It's, cr- it's crazy when you, when you look back on it. For me, I, one moment I always remember that I always thought was fucking hilarious. When they used to have the show, uh, the, the, the part called um, Cracker Fat where they'd get the blow up inflatable dolls. You'd have mm. to tackle one of them. And Fatty showed them how to do it. Uh, it was explaining how the game works, tackled it in. They then got the inflatable doll, they put it back up and it was going around in a circle, but then he was trapped on the inside. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and he had to try and get out of it. So he tried to go through one of the gaps and it caused a domino effect, <laughs> knocking over every fat doll around the oh. thing. It was fucking great. When the when the scorecard blew up on him as yeah. well with, with um. Mario, yeah, a, a lot of cracking moments. It was there. Just, just cows there, like all the times they'd go, they'd go to Parish and he'd go off the jumps. Daredevil dudes. Awesome, Daredevil dudes, yeah. eating the chilies yeah. and all that. And he was just like, for, you know, for our, our generation and our age group, we, just, we grew up with Fatty in the footy show and, and all the brilliance of him. And just watching him, he just just always seemed and came across such a down to earth, genuine fellow. And as you said, Kemp, it's like, I think probably, you know, the younger generation in particular, they'd see this Larry on the footy show and that, but they'd forget. The 1995 Origin Series as coach, the unwinnable series, Fatty coaches comes out, they win 3 0, a premiership winning captain, all the great things he did there. But you see nowadays how much a lot of ex footballers get thrown into media, how much they struggle and like how difficult it is to adapt to the media landscape. Fatty hosted one of the biggest shows on free to air television for what, the best part of two decades, mm. and it just aged incredibly well that entire time. Just such a great, great man. and. I've never met the fat, but even like you watch him interview people and notoriously tough people to interview, even in the modern day, like Wayne Bennett, and you just see the smirk that Wayne has on his face when he's talking to fat because of the admiration he has for him. And a lot of these like key media types, we saw the, the Gus Gould tribute to him on, on Twitter during oh, yesterday as well. Such a special man, the fat. So yep. yeah, you'll have a long leg. He's, he's a really good example of je ne sais quoi. <laughs> because if you were to go, okay, Let's write down on paper what is required to be the host of a big show. He wouldn't tick any of those boxes. No. Like, he, you know, he's not buttoned up. He's not all. But at the same time, he has that special something that, A, you just can't not like the bloke. The, the timing, the ability to make people bring their defence down. He just, again, you can't teach that. You've either got it or you don't. And he's just, mm. yeah, he's, he is truly like a trailblazer. He was one of the first genuinely to go into media and create opportunities for all of these ex-players that now are in media. Yeah, and I think as well, like when you look back at how that show used to run and everything, like some of the funniest bits would be fat holding the show notes and dropping them. <laughs> yeah. And you know, like you, you think all these TV shows, they have to be polished, everything has to be perfect. And fat would just go, mm, yeah. Nah. Just turn it, yeah, it was great. And then another thing, like, I think he, I feel like he had this perception of him like, because of you know the way he dressed and that that he was like unprofessional and these sorts of things and there'd be little bloop, bloopers where like he'd fart on air or he'd drop an <laughs> f-bomb and he'd just drop his head because he knew what he'd done and all those sorts of things and he'd just giggle but it was his ability to turn these moments into just pure comedy yep. and like great television and get on with the show and that it's like so he might be unprofessional compared to other hosts of other television shows, but what he did, like it was pretty groundbreaking, certainly in the footy community, to be able to come on and, and host a television show as an ex-footballer in, with such a like blasé attitude to it. He's, in many ways, in his own way, he's a genius. Well, like. the, it's, it's like what Gus Good, it takes a very smart man to play the fool. Yeah. Like he, he, pl- he played the character, but he's a very intelligent guy there. He's almost the first example of people almost putting their money where their mouth is, where they go, we don't want the button up person that we can't relate to. Like I can't relate to a robot. I want someone. And you look at the internet and like YouTube and Instagram and social media. The reason why it's so successful is like, is because the gap of professionalism that used to exist between network television and people is no longer there. It's just a person filming themselves. And that's what Fatty did so well is he closed that gap between the audience and the host where you felt like your uncle or your, your dad or whoever or your mate was up there hosting a TV show. Almost he shouldn't be there, but he is there because he's so good at it. He's, um, and, and just when you actually look at, like, imagine today if one of the biggest shows in the country was a rugby league show. It would be, like, we wouldn't believe it. That, that's, how, that's what he was, though. Mm. It was one of the biggest shows on TV and it was a rugby league show. We would only dream of that now. Like, that's how good he was at, at what he did. Obviously, he got the, all, all the awards and everything. Like, I don't pe- think people really appreciate how hard that would be. To, I mean, put it this way. Tomorrow, 
if someone said, okay, we need someone to be a host of a footy show that had skits every single week, imagine the amount of money that would have to get put behind it to make it successful. And he did it year in, year out. It's just, it's an incredible achievement. Incredible. And- as you Incredible. sort of allude to it already, Kempi, but just w- that footy show skit where they had the pest just annoy him all day at that country rugby league carnival. Oh, bro. That summed up Fatty Borton mm. because anyone else would have blown their lid <laughs> far earlier than he was. And then even his blow up was the most polite blow up of all time. That said all about his character. I'll tell you what else, one of my funniest memories is the um, y- yogurt uh, skit. The anti-ads. Splat. Yeah. The anti ads. Yeah. The anti ad with Stella. <laughs> 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 And, and, and the good thing about those anti ads were like he, for the one with the Sterlo with the splat. So they do the ad, but then they'd show the bloopers after it, which would yeah. be even funnier than the ad. <laughs> As good on script, even better off script. Like who else could sit there and hold a pen? The pen leaks all over him, <laughs> and that becomes one of his moments. Or when I think Daryl Broman or someone was talking, he just farts, and that just that just becomes a moment. You, I think was it the um, with Steve Irwin where the the snake shut all over him <laughs> like there's just there's just so the flower where he did to mario it's you watch it there's a 25 minute best of fatty compilation on on youtube it gets a run at least by yearly put for in me. the show notes it'll be in the show yeah, notes best sure. of fatty on youtube to make sure to check it out but when you think about it outside of like maddie who else has done like gone on to do like obviously sterlo went on to be mm. more of a serious commentator i, I miss sterlo i was a commentator oh, was yeah. so good mm. um but like, really, there's Fatty and there's M- Matty Johns. And uh, you know, would Matty be who Matty is if it wasn't for? Oh, Ball? Maybe, maybe not. You, he was one of the first. He was one of the first. And like, yeah, like that, that's how rare it is. So it's we're we're talking about what, 30, 35 years now, maybe even longer. What, forty years? Mm. And there's two. That's that's how special of a bloke Fatty is. So what an incredible career. And um, yeah, the fact that in media where it's like year in year out people getting replaced and you know the next big thing comes through and then they're gone in a year or two he was there for like freaking 40 years or something or 30 years like that is that's unheard of in media it's unheard of yeah um so what an incredible career and as as i said like we wouldn't be sitting here if fatty didn't lay the the platform or the foundation for to allow like ex players to create their own thing and then obviously fans to come in and, and provide content what i loved about the footy show too is i felt like it it really was connected to the rugby league community. Yeah. They did a really good job of like, it, it, w- it was a representation of the community rather than a show being spoken to the community. Sometimes I feel like there's a real disconnect between mm-hmm. um, the actual show and the community. So yeah, Fatty Borton. Uh, even just finding like the balance between humor and real footy chat. Like mm. they, I just, I never remember the missing that mark. Nah. No. It sounds easy, but it's hard to do. No, nah, it's. I mean, it, to to be funny and also give you good insight. I mean, yeah. that's why Matty Johns is one of the goats, and that's why Fatty's one of the goats. Is because you get every every five minutes you'll be sitting there laughing your ass off, and then all of a sudden you're like, oh my god, I've just heard the most profound footy knowledge I've ever heard mm-hmm. in my life, and that's what Matty does so good. That's what Fatty does so well. Um, so yeah, one of the goats. Use code Fatty uh, for Italian food. I'm sure the big fella loves Italian food. I'm mm-hmm. sure he does. Um, now, boys, that's a, thanks to Menulog, as always. A massive thank you to Menulog. Just come up my feed, boys. First look inside the... First look inside the restored Notre Dame. Is that how you say it? Notre Dame? Ah. <laughs> Cathedral. I actually got to walk past that when I went to Europe. Was getting all fixed in that. Very special. Huge. Went to one of the oldest bookstores in the world. Very spe- Got to read a book on the balcony. Yeah, wow. And I felt guilty because like all these people were walking past and I could tell they're like, damn, that's a good spot to be reading a book. <laughs> but I was like, I got here first, bro. I got here first. But I was, like, I was there for a while. So I was like, am I overstaying my welcome? But I was like, no, that's a new person that just walked in. They don't know how long I've been here. So <laughs> that's what I was thinking. That's what I was thinking. And I got to read my favorite book of all time as well. What's and, that? Um, it's called The Farseer Trilogy. Mm-hmm. Um, it's about a young man called Fitz. It's, it's a fantasy novel. Mm-hmm. Uh, and yeah, it's about a, a young half prince. Uh, but I won't spoil it for you, Ryan. I know you want to What's read it that. Called again? It's called the Farsi Trilogy. So it's okay. a book. It's a well, the Farsi Trilogy is three, but the actual whole se- whole uh, series is <coughs> I think it's like sixteen books or something. Holy shit! Yeah, right. Um, but yeah, so I got to read the first one of that in the little seat. Out, I think Hemingway even went to the bloody that place to get books and that. Yeah, so wow. a bit of history there, Ru. That's bit of cool. history there for you. But yeah, if you want to go to Europe, the Notre Dame is uh, it's it's good to go. It's good to go. Um, not an ad, by the way. We weren't we weren't sponsored by the French government. <laughs> um, 
I didn't realise we were recording. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> New South Wales Blues coach. Notre Dame. There's more important things to talk about, baby. It's the Blues coach. That's right. Origin chat in the off-season. We love it. Has reportedly, Laurie Daly has reportedly surged into contention to coach the New South Wales Blues from 25 onwards. It's understood he has the support of several key figures who wish to negotiate and announce the deal as early as next week or potentially even any day now. New South Wales Rugby League CEO David Trodden told SEN a couple of weeks ago that New South Wales Rugby League will have a coach by Christmas. His quote was, what we are looking for is someone who can fit into that structure seamlessly. Matt King, Brett White, John Carwright were on the staff last year, so King also obviously fit that criteria. There was also whispers that it was down to say King and Daly. Um, but yes, it's looking like Daly is the front runner. Um, look, from a rugby league fan's perspective, what I do love about this is Laurie Daly's opportunity to coach a New South Wales side, not against that eight in a row mm. dominant side. Now, granted, he was the coach in 2014 that, that broke the drought, but all the other years he was against, you know, we look back on that now and just go, the fact that those series were even close is almost crazy. That's how good the sides were. So I love the opportunity of him being able to coach a side where they're pretty much even. They're, they're like going into next year on paper, I would say they're essentially even to a degree. Maybe you could argue um, the Blues is a, is a little bit better on paper, but essentially even. There's not the big gap that there was before. Yep. And so I, I really do love that Laurie Daly, one of the game's real nice guys, gets an opportunity to coach the Blues again. Um, in an origin series. I guess the question that you'd have to ask is, you know, having been out of the game for a while now, the game has changed quite a bit. Um, you know, I'm assuming that the Blues are probably looking at this and going, okay, although Laurie Daly has been out of the game for a while, what we're gonna do is we're gonna stack his assistant coaches that are in the game. Um, but I guess that would be the biggest question of like, being out of the game for a while, it's changed like, not even just like the normal change you would see in the last 10 years, it's genuinely rules have changed that have sh shifted the, the, the fabric of the game. Um, however, from a, as I said, a rugby league fan's perspective, I love the opportunity for Laurie Daly to get back into that coaching role against, with a good roster against a side that's essentially equal. Yeah, it is a good point because when I first saw the name Laurie Daly come up, I'll be honest with you, I was nervous, but man, I think I'm just so scarred from that eight in a row mm. that Laurie had to... Um, contend with so i'm happy to see him get another shot as you said you know 2014 that was an, in, an incredible origin series um you know and he did it with halves of you know with all due respect to them you know josh reynolds trent hodkinson when you compare that to the guys of the eight in a row and whatnot pretty incredible so and at the end of the day like if it's not laurie daly who is it mm. we really don't have that many options i i think the, the last 12 months i think probably 12 months ago i would have thought your new south wales coach needs to be someone that can really inspire guys it's like a bit of a hero that's because we've had your slaters meningas these sort of guys <coughs> madge obviously changed that completely and i think i think it has become evident that you do need someone who is up to date with the current game rules how it all plays out and i mean that is a concern i have about laurie daly but i come back to it once again if it's not going to be laurie daly who is it going to be mm. Yeah, I'm happy enough uh, with Loz getting the nod. And to, to your sort of point, Rue, of the short list of people on it, there was no one that I sat there and went, yep, has to be him or has to be him. Yeah. Loz has been there, he's done it. Like, you go through 2014 and you go through that Maroon side that he beat. You mentioned Hodkinson and Reynolds as our halves. Their halves were Conk and Thurston for two of the three games. Inglis, Slater, Boyd, Hodges. Like, their team was unbelievable, as we know. Daly Trevins on the bench for two of those three games. And I just think with Loz, people are going to straight away go, you know, not coaching the NRL, how long has he been out of the game for, et cetera, et cetera. At the end of the day, the head coach of an Origin Series, you want to be a man manager. You need to get people to play for you. As Kempi, you said, he'll get a, a bunch of assistant coaches in there who are still involved in the modern game, more so than Loz is. They'll be the brains behind the operation. Mm. That's the reality of it. And Loz... As you said, one of the best, best blokes in the rugby league community who has been there and done it not only as an origin coach but as a player as well uh, for many years with the Raiders. Uh, I think it's a, a good appointment uh, of the list that was there. He was my the one I was hoping that would get the nod and I think can come in and do a job. Yeah, I'm, I'm all right with it. Yeah, and, and as you boys said, like, who else is really jumping out yeah. you know, for that role? The only – and look, this is being super nitpicky because uh, – Trodden, the CEO, saying what we're looking for is someone that who can fit into the structure seamlessly. Obviously, that is a true statement. And he, he so it's going to sound nitpicky. The only thing I worry about the Blues is 
uh, right, believing that the system alone was what got the victory last year and it wasn't Mark Maguire's uh, unique touches that got the win. Again, I'm, Trotten isn't alluding to that. I, I just, I've seen so many times clubs, for example, where you, the club gets a bit of a success and then the administration feel like they're the ones that got this success and it wasn't actually the touch of the great coach. You know, we've seen, we've seen certain clubs win premierships and then all of a sudden they get two, three years into that dominant period and all the administration's like, ah, oh, you know, we could put anyone in that coaching role. It's actually our system that got the job done. Again, I'm not saying David Trotten is saying that. I'm just, I just, that's the one worry I would look out for with the New South Wales thing is, is that the head coach really, really does matter and, he, and they may fit into the system, but the system isn't usually the main reason why the win was made. Like, for example, Billy Slater could set up all the systems in the world and let's say we moved him on and brought someone else in. Well, they're not Billy Slater. Mm. So, um, again, that's that's being super nitpicky and it's not suggesting Trot and saying that, but it is, I do see it time and time again with clubs where there's a bit of success, the administration feel like they're more responsible for, responsible for it than the actual coach. Like, okay, here's a good example. Look at the Broncos, all that success, all those years, they had everything set up. Everything's like Wayne Bennett had set all these pathways up, the best young talent in the competition, all this money, everything good to go. Wayne leaves. You can have the best system in the world, but Wayne left and there's been no success in a grand final since. So, yeah, that's the, the thing that I just, just to note, just to note. Yeah, and I get where you're coming from. And if that is the angle of that quote, I agree because the reality with New South Wales, I think the last few years has been the system has been when Trell, Turbo and Nathan are available, we'll fire shots. Mm. None were available last year. Mm. Yeah. You have to give credit for match for that. Yeah. But Trell was the only one he played one game, killed it in that one game. Outside of that, Nathan Cleary didn't play a game. They had to change halfback and fullback after game one. Mm. That's just about unheard of in State of Origin to come yep. back and win a series. You have to give match credit for that. Yeah. And look, as I said, I'm, I don't think Trotten is actually implying that at all. It's just it's just kind of covering that base if, if it is the case. Um, I think as well as like, You'd have to get a few wins in a row to, to believe that a system is responsible mm. for, for a victory. Um, but I, I don't think that's where the Blues are. I think that they've learned a lot over the last few years. I think that, um, I think that the, what uh, Trotten is probably uh, alluding to has a lot to do with what Madge has put in. So it's, it might even be a, a compliment to Madge of what he's put in and, and Trotten probably believes quite strongly mm. in what Madge has put in. Because um, I think in a perfect world, we all agree like, Trotten would probably have liked Maguire to stay there for, for at least a few years. Yep. Um, so, yeah, again, just, a, just a, something to kind of think about. In regards to his assistant, the good thing is, is that Matt King, Brett White, Cartwright, you would, you'd assume that they'd be available to be assistant coaches again this year. So, like, as you kind of spoke about, Timmy, is like if, if Daly can just come in and get the boys in the best headspace possible, you – you know there is a game plan, which Trotten is kind of alluding to here, a structure that does work. Mm. There's a structure and a style of play that does work. Now, it's, it's a matter of can Laurie Daly get the best out of that playing roster to play like you guys played last year, which was a, as a hyper-aggressive, you know, heaps of metres. Um, if, if anything, it was almost the opposite of Queensland, which was attack from anywhere, spin the ball whenever we can. And so if, if Daly can kind of like plug and play that and go, all right, let's go into this series with a big forward pack with, um, with backs that can all run for 200 plus metres and then just get the best out of the boys, you know, could be another series win. Mm, yeah, and I think the best thing about it as well, coming in as such a respected figure in the game and likeable figure, I imagine that just about anyone that Laurie Daly reaches out to will get on board, mm. whether that's, and I don't know his personal relations, but whether that's Joey Johns, whether he wants Gus Gould, whether that's mm. getting Ricky Stewart as, a, as one of his great mates involved in the camp, whoever that might be, I can't imagine there being too many people who'd be turning down Laurie Daly and the opportunity to, to work underneath him and be involved with the Blues camp. So, yeah. I think as well, the advantage he's got compared to, you know, as we said, going up against that eight in a row side was brutal. Mm. But back then it was, who do we pick? Yep. His job now is who don't you pick realistically yeah. for New South Wales? Like he Much had better a, boat to be in. Had a, he had a 40% win rate during his, what, four or so years for the Blues. He won, I think it was nine loss, six wins against that Maroon mm. side. You looked at it then and you're like, as a Blues fan, you're like, we need to win, it needs to be better than this, we don't care who we're playing. But when you look back in hindsight, you go... In reality, it's not too bad. Oh, and yeah. one that was, again, a near-unwindable series in 2014, not a bad effort. Yeah, 
Nah, agreed, agreed. So, you know, the, the positive for the Blues is, is that last year, you know, even when Michael Maguire was selected, he ended up being a, a great selection. So they're, they're, the administration, including Trotten, deserve credit for that selection yep. last year yep. when a lot of people probably were against that selection. I um, had my concerns. 100%. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I mean, I, I was unsure as well. Um, I was unsure as well. I think that the the Kiwi series did really kind of turn me around, but I was unsure as well. However, Trotten and, and the, the administration, they saw it before everyone really. Mm. Um, and so there is evidence of them being able to pick them in and pick it right. So I think that like, if I'm a Blues fan, there's no real reason why I wouldn't back this administration in to make the right call because they made it with, and it, you even look at the start with Freddie, like that was the right call with Freddie too. He started really well. He ended up, win he has the, one of the best win percentages um, as a coach in history. Um, so yeah, I think that I think I'd be back in the Blues in administration that they might that they've done enough due diligence to make the right call. Just going to be a big like the first call I assume you're going to have to make is who's going to be the halfback. Oh my god, and right. it is such an enormous call to make. And mm. and look, in reality, if like Flaws coming in, if Latrell and Tommy Turbo are fit going into this series and no injuries, Rue, you'd coach just to a clean sweep, I reckon. Oh. I'd do it without. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> it's just it's no it's no contest if the boys are fit. Oh, fuck, settle down, mate, settle down. <laughs> All righty, Tigers spine. Shane Richardson declared the Tigers 25 spine is the best in the comp. Buller, Galvin, Luai, Coruscant, obviously. He said, we got the cream. There's no doubt we've got the best spine in the comp. Uh, Abby Coruscant was also after that, asked after that, and you know, he had a little giggle, little giggle to himself and was like, you know, I really appreciate the backing uh, from Richardson. Um, Look, what I like about this from a content perspective, <laughs> gets people talking, um, you know, it gets the, the Tigers in the paper. It's, you know, it just creates buzz around the Tigers, whether you hate it or love it. And, you know, I think most people wouldn't have them in the top, um, you know, the top tier spines. However, again, like this is great for rugby league. It's people talking, it's, it's, it's a bit of banter, it's a bit of yarn. And you tell you what, if they go on and kill it, Richardson looks like a genius. Um, you know, I think we, oh, I won't speak for you boys, but you know, they're not a top tier spine for me yet. Um, look, I'll tell you what though, in a few years, if Buller can continue to improve, if Galvin turns out to who we think he can be and Luai, we know what he can do and Api Korosau is at his best, I think in two or three years, they could potentially be pushing for one of the better spines, but I think they're a few years away from it at the moment. I agree. I think it's potentially the best spine we've ever seen. That's one coming off three wooden spoons in a row. Like it's improving. <laughs> That's There's a great no point. that. It's a, definitely a spine that you wouldn't think would be on the bottom of the table. 100%. Yeah, yeah. So they, they, they are in a good spot, and I'd be happy with where they're at as far as their spine goes. Best. Please. Like, oh, that's yeah. Well, I just... He doesn't believe that. I just don't... What's, what's the point? Like, I, I even thought, like, watching Appy's response, like, I didn't read it. I, I watched his interview. Yeah, I watched it as well. Fuck, he was uncomfortable. <laughs> I was like, why? <laughs> From why, a why can't we just come in, work it. our ass off and just fight our way off the bottom? Why do we have to, I don't know, like it's just noise again that I just don't oh. think they need. Rue, From a content I, point of view, I love it as well. Rue, I've got, that. I'm too stuck in my content brain. Yeah. I'm too stuck, I love it. It's banter, it's talk, it's whatever. But you're absolutely right. From a footy perspective, you're sitting there going, brother, you are putting way too much of a target on our yeah. back right now. But from a content perspective, I love it. Um, it's, it's, yeah, it's just, it's banter. It's, it's, it's putting them in the headlines, it's all that kind of stuff. But yeah, from a rugby league perspective, it's tough. And once again, if you want to put that target on Jerome and Appy, sure, they can handle it. You've got two kids in the rest of the spine who mm. look very talented, but like, I think it's fair to say Buller suffered from some degree of second year syndrome last year. Galvin's going into it this year. Like, it's just, I think it's just unnecessary. Yeah. I, know, I see what you're saying. I, I, I tend to, like, I agree. Mm. If I was doing that, I would, the, the least I talk, the better, because I don't yep. want to put any pressure on. But I guess you just got to back. Richo's been there and done it, mm. you know? Yeah. Maybe there's a method to the madness. You know what else, like, sort of frustrated me a little bit? Like, I think he said it the day they announced their new jersey, which I thought was mad, by yeah. the way. It's like, oh, good, something good to talk about with the Tigers, and then this overtakes it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Timmy, I'd love to hear your thoughts, mate. Yeah, weird thing to say. And it's like, I just feel like, even though obviously being a bit tongue in cheek and that, and how much he meant it, probably not too, too much. But just like, I just wish he like had disclaimer of, except for the Melbourne Storm, of course, we have one of the <laughs> best spines we've ever seen. Mm. But 
to say it and that because even then people would have been going oh they would have been because you think like best spines in there are Melbourne Storm of course then you start thinking of other ones and then you put in injuries at the Roosters and all sorts of things there would have been like a little bit of a conversation had. we could have said Luai Appy okay yeah, yeah they're top tier they're top tier but I do and yeah within two years they could be mm. because we know the potential of Buller and Gowan I do think to Rue's point I just think the pressure on Buller and Galvin, whether it's nothing, whether it's significant, I don't know, but just unnecessary pressure on those two going into it. Even like Jerome Luai going over, first time he's really, give or take, you know, Samoa stepping out of Nathan Cleary's mm. shadow and uh, at a struggling club, first time he's ever really played at a struggling club. It's just more pressure on him. Uh, for the Banto, great, but, oh yeah, if you're them boys, I reckon you're filthy. And once again, Richo, Knows those guys heaps better than I do. Maybe he's right. Maybe they'll handle it and they'll mm. explode and kill it. And if they do, full credit to him. But is it a risk you need to take? Look, yeah, it's it's obviously it's not how I would operate. Yeah, like I, I wouldn't operate it like that. I, again, I, I just lean on the fact of a from a content perspective, I love it. <laughs> it's just so entertaining. It's like it's uh, like Flano when he went to the Dragons. Like I love that. Um, but you you are right. For, like I guess it's it's different management styles. Mm. And the positive in it is that I guess. If you wanted to look at it glass half full rather than glass half empty, is like maybe they take it as, oh, geez, he really backs us. Like, yeah. you know, like f- that's awesome to hear how much Richo backs us. But I agree with you. And if I was a CEO, that wouldn't be my management style. I, yeah. I would be quite, very quiet in, in, in the media. I think the other aspect too is, you know, you've got these the young fullback, the young 5'8. Like, you've also got the most inexperienced coach in the league too. Mm. It's also a lot of pressure to put on Benji yeah. to make it work. And yeah, like there is the angle of, oh, fuck, this guy really backs us. How good's that? Could you walk into the change room and say it? <laughs> and just avoid... Yeah, I don't know. Well, yeah, yeah we, we all agree it's not how we would have handled it, but... I think this is just Richo style. Yeah. You yeah. know, because he's been pretty vocal about other things that I think he shouldn't be vocal about, you yeah. know, the whole Bateman situation, all that kind of stuff. But I think um, the way I kind of just <clears throat> compartmentalise it is I just go, okay, put me content hat on and just enjoy yeah. the ride. Mm. Um, and you know what? I thought that too until I saw Appy's response. <laughs> <laughs> so happy was so funny. Happy's like, fuck. <laughs> oh, um, we'll see. You know, like put it this way. Let's say they come out and they come tenth. Like all of a sudden, it'd be like, you know what? Maybe it did work. Maybe it was. Maybe it was good pressure. Um, I think you know. We'll, the proof will be in the pudding. It really will be. Uh, at, at this time, this is the way I kind of view it. Is it, it's not my style. I wouldn't do that. However, I haven't been CEO of an NRL club. Richo's done a lot more in the game than I have. I, I just got to trust that he knows what he's doing, I yeah. guess. Um, but I, I personally wouldn't do it. What about you, Matty? What do you reckon, mate? Okay, it's all good. All good. Um, and, you know, once again, is it because it's the Tigers that worries me more? Maybe, but I'm not sure. Like, I would, like, I just, I just think it's a weird thing for them to come out and say, no matter what club you are. Well, it, it doesn't usually work that well. Mm. Like, and also, you look at the best clubs, they don't usually come out and say that kind of stuff. Again, though, I just I have to say, like, me as a person that's never achieved that specifically, mm. very hard for me to be critical yeah. until I see the results. Yeah. Um, I, all I can sit here and say is I personally wouldn't do it, and I, I don't agree with it. However, um, hey, it's Richo. Yeah. Rabbitohs. Yeah. Panthers, mate, whatever whatever works for you, I mm. guess we'll see. We'll see. Uh, but I do feel sorry for the boys. Holy shit. Oh, Because the worst thing, and this happens all the time in media, is like there'll be an article about a player and there'll be someone else saying something about them and then people, for some reason, attach that those comments to the player. Like, for, like, for example, Nathan Cleary. When he plays, commentators speak about him all the time. And the fans... What they do is they attach that to Cleary and they start hating Cleary. Yeah. They're like, oh, everyone always just talks him up and there's 17 other blokes or there's 13 other blokes on the field. And, and then, so they're not actually angry at the commentators. They become angry at the players. And so that's the one area where I'm like, it does suck for the players because they're like, bro, I never said any of this stuff yeah, about. Put, yeah, it, put yeah. it this way, mate. Like if by round three next year, the Tigers have started and they're 0 from three and they've been beaten well, which in reality, while Tigers fans hate to hear it, they're coming off three wooden spoons. Like it could happen and it's going to take time for these new combinations to gel. As you said, people will be tagging Appy in it or Jerome Lewis at his new club and going, best spine in the comp, ha, ha, ha. So it's got nothing to do with them because it's Richo's comments. Yeah. Yeah. And that, but that's just the normal, yeah. I guess, the nature of things. But the proof will be in the pudding. You know, we may look back in six months. Like, for example, 
Flano last year, remember how vocal he was in the market and, and I was quite critical of it. I was like, man, I just don't know if I would do it that way. But at the end of the day, mm. he got him nearly to a final series. So if it works, it works, man. If it works, it works. It is going to be interesting with the West High is like, yeah, have a look at the start of their season. Like, I, I know there's no easy draw in the NRL, but this is probably a better draw than what most could have got the first month. They go Newcastle, Para, Dolphins um, into the Warriors. So the only team they have to play that made the top eight last year is the Newcastle Knights, who are in eighth place and were, in my opinion, a distance. It's a dream start. Seven. It's a good start. Like, you can't... I'll tell you what, if they don't start relatively well, you'd be warning signs. As in, like, warning signs for if they can't beat some of the teams at the start of the year... They're probably going to struggle when they do get to in the first sides. seven weeks the only team they play that made the top eight last year is newcastle and they play them twice yeah it's not a bad start not a bad start at all and i would look at those two rosters and go there's not that much obviously kale and ponger is the big difference but there's not that much difference between the two rosters yeah yeah um on paper at least uh so look maybe there's a method to his madness richo as i said from a content perspective i love it uh, we'll see. We'll see. I'm, I'm so interested to see Lockie Galvin this year. Talk about pressure. I mean, he already had mountains of pressure on him because of how good of last year was for him. Um, and in, in coming into this year, like the wraps around him, you know, there's going to be, I think by 20 end of, was it this year he can negotiate with another club or the next year? I think it's this year. So as in, so. as in this November coming. So there's that as well. You just never, you know, you know, around what August that'll start kicking up about, Resigning. Matter of fact, Tigers have already come out and said that they were trying to extend him right now. Um, but I'm super interested to see Lockie Galvin this year. Jeez. I, I know he's not part of the spine, but he's obviously heavily linked to it. I'd love to see if this statement would have been made two weeks ago if before Terrell May had signed. Because mm. for me, before that, that's a forward pack that I was really, really concerned about. Yep. Really worried about this young spine, part of this young spine having to play behind it. Yeah, well, to think about. in the 1.2k run for the Tigers preseason, came out, beat the club record, Lockie Galvin, by three seconds, which he set last year. No way. Yeah. What did he get? Does it say? Give me a few seconds. I reckon he got four, 420, 425. 412. 412. Nice. Nice. <laughs> What was your time, Beat? Um, I didn't even, I didn't even think we one point two. I can't even remember to be honest. Did you have the endurance, mate, or were you just an out and out speedster? No, mate. No, I'm a national champion in eight hundred meters, mate. <laughs> um, <laughs> Good door. <laughs> uh, that was a very, very long time ago. Trust me. Now I'm just a fucking sloppy mess. Um, <laughs> Okay, guys, Hubble Black Friday sale. Hubble Hub brings together live and upcoming sports in one view, so you won't have to jump in and out of different apps to find where to watch your favourite sports this summer. Even better, sport on Hubble Hub is integrated into one easy-to-navigate interface across your favourite apps. Hubble has an amazing Black Friday offer that is available right now. 50% off Hubble Hub, now only $49.50, up until 11.59, Sunday 8th of December. So that's this Sunday. It's sports and entertainment for less. Plus, it's super convenient. Buy now at hubble.com.au. That's H-U-B-B-L.com.au. H-U-B-B-L.com.au. And as I said, guys, only $49.50 until this Sunday. So you make sure you want to get it, uh, get in and get it done if you are keen. All righty, Jonah Pezzett is off contract and can talk to other clubs. Storm have reportedly been locked in negotiations with Pezzett's management about an extension for weeks. It's understood Pezzett wants a release clause in his contract if, if Hughes re-signs. Uh, Pezzett and his management have reportedly also met with the Knights for a dinner. Ponga was at the meeting to sell Pezzett the dream. Um, again, this is all reportedly, guys, so it's not 100% not confirmed, but, you know, you, the fact that he hasn't re-signed and the fact that he has met with the Knights, it sounds pretty true that he's, he's weighing up his options. Um, Look, it's, it's one of those tough ones where he's coming to first grade peasant and he's played decently. You know, he hasn't played poorly, but he also hasn't set the world alight. So it's like, you know, it's because he's at the storm, he has the added extra, uh, that like makes the decision harder. You watch guys like Harry Grant who are super patient and they wait three or four years and they wait till they're 23 or whatever. The best decision of their career. Go on to be, he's gonna be the best nine of his generation play for his country, play for the state. And so you have, you've got to look at that and go, do I stay at the storm almost guaranteeing that I will be the best version of myself at the storm? Or do I back myself and go to another club and have a much better opportunity of playing first grade? 
uh, and most likely get paid a bit more. It's a really tough one because with Pezet, I just haven't, I've seen a solid seven there, but I, if you were to say, is he going to be a really good seven in the NRL? It'd be a coin flip for me. I, I just don't know. I just don't know. And that's, that's not a knock on the kid at all. It's just, I haven't seen enough of him yet to know whether he'll do well in, in first grade. And so I'm assuming that the contract that Knights will be offering him would be like a three or four year deal. I'm assuming as well that the Knights would be offering a contract to be their starting seven. And so that's where you, I guess, if you are weighing up, should he, should or shouldn't he leave? It's a matter of, do you believe he is ready to lead an NRL team around? And I just don't have enough information to make that call yet. Uh, I would say any club that, you know, has signed you, any, sorry, any player that the Storm have kept at the club for a long period of time like him as a, as a rookie, that's a huge tick that, you know, they don't just bring anyone to the, the NRL. He's got a really good junior um, pedigree or a decent one. And, you know, we all talk about the New South Wales game. Um, man, it's a, it's a tough one. It is a tough one. I would lean towards spending a couple more years at the Storm. Uh, you just, you know, Hughes, it's not like... It's not like Hughes is injury prone at all, but at the same time, he's not the most durable player in history mm -hmm. either. Uh, he's an explosive athlete. Soft tissue damage um, injuries can happen. Um, me personally, I reckon if I was giving him advice, it would be stay at the Storm for a couple more years. I, I just don't know whether he's ready to take on the pressure of being a seven at a club just yet. However, if you're a young kid and you're getting offered hundreds of thousands of dollars to be in the main seven, you back yourself in. So. Yeah, it's tough. And I, like, just to add to that, if you are getting, you know, offered big money to go be the main seven in Newcastle, like, he's a Newcastle kid as well. Yeah. So it is an opportunity to go home, which would definitely play a role. I think the other thing, mate, is that 12 months ago, Jonah Pazette was the next halfback down there. Mate, I personally think if something was to happen to Jerome Hughes in the preseason, he was out. I think Wishy takes that jersey. Mm. I don't even think he's the next guy up at Melbourne at the moment, realistically. So... I think that's got to play a role for him. I personally don't think he's ready to come in and be a halfback for an entire season. I think that we've what we've seen so far is a kid that can handle first grade, but I'm not, I'm just not sure if he's going to be the star that a lot of people well, have sort of put on him. What I find from a Knights perspective, yeah. not this and this has no reflection on Jonah because he's got a bloody good junior pe pedigree. He's played he has played good footy when he's came into the Melbourne Storm. Like I, I actually haven't seen a game where I've felt he's played poorly at all. What I'm not understanding from a nice perspective, like the guys you've got there already, they're not too old. They've, they've played, a, a, compared to Jonah, a lot of first grade. Um, is he that much better than them? I'm, I'm not sure. That's what I'm a bit surprised at, that they are not just backing the players they've currently got at the NRL. I'd understand if Jonah came in and just killed it, or maybe they've got footage um, from him in reserve grade where he's absolutely tearing apart. If that's the case, I get it. Um, but yeah, that's, that's surprising for me. I mean, the guys that are in that room at the moment up there in Newcastle, you've done them no favours. They've got you to finals two years in a row. Mm. Yeah. Like, it's, not, it's not like you're in a dire situation where you're at the bottom of the ladder year in, year out, and your halves is a basket case. You've got the guys there. You're just, in my opinion, they're just mismanaging them. Well, how, like, for example... Like, if I'm Pazette, mate, I'm looking at the way the Knights' halves have been chopped and changed. Mm. I'm going, is that where I want to be? Yeah. Well, well I, for example, like, how come Cogger can't just be the seven and, you know, gamble be the, the six. And, you know, like that, yep. I just, yeah, it's a bit surprising. It's a bit surprising. What do you reckon to me? Yeah, look, I think money will talk in this one because, you know, in a perfect world, Jonah Pezzett, especially coming off an ACL injury as well, which is a big factor in this, he stays at the Storm for at least another season, you know, continues to learn under Bellamy, Jerome Hughes, etc. cetera. Uh, but like as Guru made the point, he might be potentially even behind Tyron Wishart uh, to get a, as the next man up sort of thing. So because the Storm now have the emergence of Tyron Wishart who can step up so well in the absence of Munster or Jerome Hughes, I can't see them paying too, too much money for Jonah Pezzett who could be second, third string coming in. We know that NRL clubs will pay on potential for an NRL quality halfback. And he's so early on in his career, 10 games, Jonah Pezzett, he's had in that time a couple of tries, a couple of try assists. As you said, Kempi, he's been solid without setting the world alight, but he's also done it for a gun club in the NRL. I just think a club will probably come along, they'll pay on potential, he'll be coming off an ACL injury, he doesn't know what the future holds injury-wise and all that. He'll be, he's only 22 when the season kicks off in March. 
I I can see him I can see him taking money and going mm. elsewhere. Um, I said would love to see him stay at the Storm for another year, but if that's me and someone says three to four years and we'll give you you know maybe it's seven hundred k or six hundred, hard to turn down. Yeah, I mean look, if, yeah, you know when you say those kind of numbers. And you go, okay, from a football perspective, I don't think leaving Storm, I don't think anyone leaving Storm mm. is a good idea because they're so good. But if you're Jonah Pezzett and you're getting offered five to 600K over three or four year, each year, you'd almost be crazy not to take and, it, wouldn't you? And the Storm, quite obviously in a premiership window, like they're near enough favourites to win it uh, in 2025, they're sitting there, oh, we're not giving, and I'm throwing numbers out there, it might be 500 or 600K, <coughs> but they're probably going, we, you know, we're not giving. Pez at 600k when well, we've got Wishy who can come in if one of our uh, main halves goes down and we have options so it just it feels like a moving on the Knights one is a weird one because of how many halves they've got I thought there'd be another club maybe yeah. but I, I, w- I would love to know from his manager like how, mu- how much interest is there you know because it's at the moment it just seems like it's the Knights um, I, I don't think there'd be as much interest as what people mm. are sort of talking up yeah, even have a look like, you know, over the last, like he's, last three years he's played 22 games in Queensland Cup. Like it's um, 11 tries, this, two tries, which isn't a train wreck by any means. But like, like I, I just, I personally think that under 19s game he had a couple of years ago is equally the best and the worst thing for him. Because mm. it set this expectation that people have of him that I, I don't personally see. I think he's a solid first grade halfback. I think he'll do a job. But if Newcastle sign him on some big bucks, he'll get touted as a saviour. And I, I'm just not convinced he, he's going to be that guy, mm. which is unfair on him. Yeah. Are, are we thinking this is probably for 2026, or would he be trying to get a release to play immediately? Do you think? Surely he'd be waiting till 26. Coming off an ACL. Mm. Surely the expectation isn't, um, you know, like You're saying that if you can lock in that deal coming off an ACL, for sh- that's another big factor. One hundred percent. But then Melbourne Storm aren't going to let him go, are they? They're, they're in a Premiership window. You're not letting anyone go, are you? Like depth wise and all that. I don't know. Oh, the- yeah, look, maybe it is. He's trying to get out early potentially, but if I'm the Storm, I'm just going, no way. Us, this yeah. is we're, we're trying to win comps here. Like the night one is so weird. Gamble, Hastings, Cogger. Crossland playing yeah, half. Phoenix, yeah. Like, the last thing they need is another half. And then you've got um, the guy from England the, the, at six. Um, yeah, uh, Price. Price. Yep. It's weird. It's like, strange. Th- granted, obviously talking 2026, if they were to try and get Pez at well, two of them are probably bugging off. Yeah, that Hastings time. will be gone by then. Mm. Um, and, oh, man, just doesn't anyway. make Look, put it this way. From a rugby league perspective, I reckon you spend another year or two at the Storm. They're in a premiership window. You never know. Players can injured, all that kind of stuff. But if he's getting offered five to 600K, three-year deal, five to 600K each year, you'd almost be crazy to say no to it. Like mm. that, that kind of money doesn't come around very often. Um, and also, you'd have to assume Hughes is at least four years off for, like leaving the Storm, at least. He's, what, 28 now or so? Yep. So then they're, they're not going to... He's, and I think his contract ends, what, 27 maybe? I don't know, it's easy for us to say, but like, John is 21, he's still young. He's so oh, young as a half. There's so much footy ahead of you. Yeah. In saying that, like, these kind, if, if it is true that there's a three or four year deal on the table, they don't come very often. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, but I, I agree with you though. From a rugby league perspective, mate, you're never leaving the storm. Yeah. It's so, mm. like, you, you can guarantee you're getting the best out of yourself at the storm. Hughes is 30 and 2026 is last year. See, that's interesting. Then you go, mate, stick around. Mm. You don't know what's going to, like, at least for another two years, you're going to get the best development you can get and you may be the next guy up to B7. I know Wishart's there, but, I'm, you know, Munster is also 30, I think. But also, barring injury, that's two years of Q Cup. Yeah. Really? It is, but you could be the seven at the Melbourne Storm. Like, that does not come around often. Mm. And also, like, uh, I guess if you're, pl- but he's been playing Q Cup already, and he, if this deal is here now, surely that deal's going to be there in two years if he continues to get better. I don't know. It's a tough one. It is a tough one. If you if you're his manager, what are you doing? I think I. Uh, <sighs> fuck. I don't. I honestly, it's such I don't a know, fucking mate. tough I, one. I, eh? I don't know. I, I, 
yeah, I have no idea. There's, I, I, I personally think the best thing for Jonah Pezzett and his development would be to stay in Melbourne. Mm. I don't think he's ready to be a starting halfback of a team that's looking for someone to turn them around uh, in a team that can't decide who's going to be their halfback week to week. But, you know, once again, he's a kid from Newcastle who wants to go home and make good money up the road. I get it. Mm. If you're 21, 22 years old and a club come to you and say, for the next three years, we'll give you five, six hundred thousand dollars I'm saying, mate, you can lock in one half million dollars over the next three years. Mm. You could potentially do your ACL again. You might not play a game for NRL for the next three years. You might be... And also, you might kill it. Like, that's another thing. He might kill exactly. it. Exactly. He's I'm, already played solidly I, in the NRL. That's a lot of money. Yeah. You know what the other thing is? Like, when I look at Newcastle and... Not so much this year, but the year before when they made the finals. Like, Hastings arrived there. Gamble played 5 eight. Like, neither of them did anything outside of just being solid. Mm. Just give KP space. Yeah. Like, I, I don't think being the Newcastle in the halves of the Newcastle Knights is an incredibly tough job. You just have to create space for KP. Mm. Like it's, it, but you just don't know if you're going to be there week to week. For the record, nowhere is it stated that it's five, six hundred thousand dollars. But I would imagine there will be a club out there somewhere willing to pay on potential, you know, ballpark of five hundred for an up and coming halfback. Who's that's at the Storm. Like yeah. the Storm the almost. Storm. Yeah. Like yeah. The, any club goes. Okay, the Storm believe in him. Fuck, he might do all right mm. here. And also, like as I said, when he's coming to first grade, he's been solid. Mm. Like that's not easy to do as a seven. I know he's at the Storm, and they're the best in the one of the best in the comp. It's not easy to do. And There's talent there. There's and, if, talent. and if it's the, if it is a, I'm, I wouldn't imagine would. But if it was three to four hundred k that he was getting offered elsewhere in the storm, say, stick with us for two fifty third ever. In that case, stick with the storm. Stick with but the if storm. someone is willing to pay overs on potential, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Lock it in. Because I reckon at the storm, he's probably on around three hundred. As mm. a, as a young half, you, you wouldn't be putting a half on minimum. Mm. That's you put outside backs on minimum um, that haven't played first grade yet. Young halves, you put them on three or four hundred grand. You just got it because yeah. they're just so valuable. Mm. Um, geez, what a, what, what's really interesting about this as well is we're, we're watching in real time how important decision making is for a young seven and how hard it is for Jonah because I'm sure people are listening right now is probably scratching their head too going, oh, I don't know, I don't know what I'd do. It's hard. It's super hard it's, and, it's, and he's a young seven, it's the hardest position on the field. Um, the good thing is though that he's got interest. The good thing is at the storm, the Knights are interested. So um, yeah, hopefully he kills it. Hopefully he kills it. Laurie what? Daly just got announced. Laurie Daly got announced. There you go. Boom. Um, all righty. Blake Moser, Benny Hunt. Ben Hunt is officially signed with the Brisbane Broncos. The signing of Hunt has reportedly put a tight hold in their salary cap, and as a result, rival clubs are expected to open negotiations with Moser as they'd be able to offer him a higher salary than the Broncos, according to the Career Mail. This is what I've been talking about for weeks now. Four weeks. And... This is why you just go, sell on a Katoni. Unfortunately, that's not a priority. Moser has to stay. The fact that there's even a worry of losing a guy like Moser is, is craziness. Now, I'm, again, I'm pure speculation, guys, which means I've got no evidence to back this up. I'm assuming it's probably management that may have just put this out there because they're probably sitting back and going, hang on a sec. You know, when we, when we re-signed last year or whenever it was, we were promised that, you know, we were next in line for this, that, and next thing. And now you've brought Ben Hunt in, which has put us back in the pecking order for the next couple of years. Um, so I can understand the frustration if you're, if you're Moser and his management because he's sitting there going, well, that's a whole other year I have to sit on the bench. For, at the very least, I'm going to be sitting on the bench for first grade. Um, so this is what I was worried about, but I think the Broncos have to do everything they can to keep him. Like, everything they can to keep him. Ben Hunt, for another year... I'd go as far as saying, like, next year when Ben Hunt does move to that nine role, I'd be I'd be sharing the time equally. But if they've got to share the time equally and, and Ben Hunt has to start off the bench to keep Moser, I'd be willing to do that. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. If it means Ben Hunt has to play a bit of a <coughs> roaming 13 role, 100%. so be it. Make it work. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think if, if they sign Ben Hunt – well, they've obviously signed Ben Hunt for the next two years. If getting Ben Hunt there – in some way cost them Blake oh. Moser. It's a failure in my opinion. Unless Massive. you win a comp in the next two years. They'd have to win a comp. They have to, or it's a failure. Anything less than a comp would be a failure. He is the under-19s captain for Queensland. So it's not just like a an average nine coming through. Like these guys don't come through often. Granted, like, you know, has he, you know, set the world alight just yet? No, but nines are so hard. Like look how many clubs right now need a good nine. Um, I think the I think that that's, that's why I keep alluding to I think we're going to have to shed an outside back to keep a guy like Moser in the cup, in my opinion. Timmy? I don't think it's as big a panic station as it sort of sounds, boys. I just think 
You reckon if they lose Moser, it's not a big well, deal? Well, woo. I reckon Hunt well, that's comes That's what we're in. talking about. We're not talking about if no, Hunt no, comes No, no, no. I the- just, I don't know. It could be wrong, but it feels like mountains out of molehills because Ben Hunt comes in, starts, plays 50, 55 minutes. Blake Moser's 20 years old. He's played nine or 10 NRL games and playing arguably the hardest physical position in the NRL as a number nine. I think he plays 25, 30 off the bench. Keeping in mind, if Ezra Mam is not available for a portion of the season, Ben Hunt plays in the halves and Moser either starts at nine or Billy Walters. Billy Walters is the one who misses out here for me. Like, it's not like Blake Moses, you know, even 22 or 23. He's 20 years old, doesn't turn 21 until May. He's very young and very inexperienced. I think as a number nine, playing 30, 35 minutes off the bench. Like, even last year, he played more than 36 minutes off the bench once in a game. Played 51 minutes in round 27. Uh, you know, I think he can do that for a year, two years with Ben Hunt. I think that's a good progression for him. Oh, he's so off contract very soon. He's though. off contract. He's going to have a lot of clubs yeah. coming after him as the next yeah. big nine it in the drives game. Drives his value down if he's sitting on the yeah, bench. Yeah, so what, he's off contract like... 26. 2026. Not signed so for he, 2026. He can, he can negotiate right now yeah. Yeah. for 26. So for 2026, they say, you know, maybe it is a share or maybe Ben Hunt's getting a bit older. You know, it, it's less time for Ben Hunt. I just think... I think they'll be fine to keep him both. Yeah, I, I think you're working under the assumption that he's just like definitely going to stay. I think what me and Rule mm. are concerned about is that he's sitting there going, hang on a sec, like I'm going to get minimal game time definitely this year, but in 26 as well. Mm. That's that's so where these other clubs can go, he's a three-year deal, 600K a year, and you're our starting hooker for fucking the next whatever you want. Especially as you said, if Ezra, if Ezra does miss the half the season, Broncos are going to show him to the rest of the league. And you're going to start mm. to see actually how good he is, yeah. I think. Yeah. Which I think will just drive his value up further and further. Yeah. Like, I mean, I'm you've got another team in Queensland who could potentially lose Reese Robson. Yeah. There are a lot of clubs that would throw a good coin at Moser. And, and so if you're his manager, you, like, we've got a. I can only assume that for the last two or three years, he's being told in contract negotiations that by this year, we hope to have you as our starting number nine. And so all of a sudden, he's an extra player away from that. And put it this way, even this year, let's say, let's say Ezra does come back halfway through the year. I don't think that that – well, look, I don't make the rules, but I, I would assume he'd miss the season. But let's say he does come back halfway through the year. That pushes Moser potentially out of the whole squad because Billy Walters could – he could be – they could decide to go with Billy Walters. Well, no, that's where they'd go. Who's more important to our future, Billy Walters or this upcoming number nine in Blake Moser? And they'll pick Blake Moser – and he stays on the bench and plays 35 to 40 minutes. Maybe it's more. Maybe they do push Ben Hunt to play that 13 role. And they, look, they probably do and, and make Ben Hunt spend 15, 20 as a 13. And then Moser gets his 50 minutes. But I think that's, that's our point. Our, our point is, is that if it comes between keeping Hunt and Moser, you would rather put Hunt offside in 26 by mm. putting him on the bench to start than putting Moser offside. Yeah, but like the point is, Moser, who's contracted for 2025... Worst case for him, it's one year in 2026 where he plays 35 minutes off the bench as a number nine. That's It's only one year that he could be going to another club as starting number nine because then by 2027 latest, Hunt will be done and he's the starting number nine for the Brisbane Broncos at, what, 22 years old? Yeah, yeah but that's still, if you're the Broncos, you're relying on him using that common sense. If another club comes in and offers him huge yeah. money, which they will and they lose him, that, that, that's a that's a travesty in my yeah, opinion. Yeah, I, I, mate, I, I'm, I'm with you, Rio. I, I think that it is concerning. I think the the, the fact that this has gotten out, that um, other clubs are begin set to begin negotiations, suggests to me that Mo, Moses' management, at the very least, is like, hang on a sec, we were like the the I guess the um, the order of how the next couple of years were going to go has now changed because you brought Ben Hunt in. Um, I think it's worrying. And, and I, look, I understand the whole concept of Mozart, him and management might be a little bit disgruntled by the Hunt signing, all those sorts of things. Uh, and then there might be in the very much short term, better opportunity elsewhere. And then opposition clubs are going, all right, if he's a little bit disgruntled, now's the time to strike, blood's in the water kind of thing. You know, he's one of the most promising up and coming number nines in the game at 20 years old. Clubs were going to come with big money offers anyway. Like that, that was going to be, that was inevitable. So again, I see the opportunity from clubs while Moses potentially a little bit off board with the club, but that was happening. Mm. Yeah, much easier, much easier to sign a bloke getting 20, 30 minutes than it is a bloke that's playing as many minutes as he wants to mm. play.
much easier to get them. Um, I think there's a lot of Broncos fans that will be a bit concerned about this as well, um, knowing of Moser how good he is. But what about like Brisbane Broncos? And I know there's more to it than that. We're talking contracts, we're talking young blokes in the game. But what about proud Brisbane Broncos club, mate? You've got to earn your right to get those big minutes and get the 60 minutes of this famous club. I think he has been trying to earn his right. That's mm. a thing. Like for the last four years, he's been building into this. Mm. This Ben Hunt thing has literally come out of nowhere. This ha- this Ben Hunt signing is not part of the plan. So he didn't he didn't change the plan. The Broncos changed the plan. So of course he's a bit like, mm. what, what's going on? Um, I, I think he's earned the right to to get the jersey. I think he's been slaving away. He's what did he say? He's twenty now. Twenty one. Twenty. Twenty. So twenty six. He'll be twenty two. Um, so in twenty six, he'll be twenty two. So that means by the time he's twenty three is when he's the main hooker at the club. At, for a young gun, that's pretty late. Mm. For a guy that's like the next mm. big thing or whatever, um, 23 years old, like, like a lot of people debut at 18, that are the next big thing. That's five years after it. Um, I, think, I think he's been patient. I think he's been patient. Um, but I, I think what will happen is, is that we will probably lose potentially both Katoni and Selwyn to keep Moza. I hope they make that priority. And I've been saying that for weeks and weeks now. All the money should be going into our spine. I guess then the next thing is, is like, Kobe Black, <laughs> that'll be the net. Because mm. the funny thing is, is with Ben Hunt coming, not only does um, Moser go down the pecking order, but Kobe Black goes down a little bit as well. Um, that'll be, so hopefully I can keep him. I think they will. I think I, they will. Um, I, at the moment, feel better about Moser than I do about Black, if I'm honest. As in what they'll be? Yeah. Oh, I, I, yeah, I'm, look, I'm not putting uh, Black in the same category as Moser. Mm. I'm just talking about like young guns mm. that are next up or whatever. But yeah, I've seen more of Moser where I'm a bit, I'm definitely confident that he'll be, a, at, at the very least, a good first grader. Um, Selwyn Cobo, Madge is not locked in. Cobo into the centres, which is where he played this year. Sel can play on the wing at centre at a high level, so I need to look at the balance of the team. Madge also said Mariner could play centre. Dean Mariner is an option at centre. He has plenty of growth in him as well. What will the Broncos 1-5 to five be? Um, I think it'll be Arthurs. I mean, it sounds like Selwyn on the wing. I think, I think Madge is going to like Selwyn on the wing because he's a big body. And it suits like the way he kind of played Origin with some big wingers that... Big, like big meter each carriage out their own end. Um, so I think, yeah, it sounds like Mariner will probably be centre and obviously Katoni the other one. It's going to be the, the year after, I think, that's the most interesting because Grant Anderson was reportedly um, going to sign with the Broncos. So that's, that's quite interesting that they're looking to 26 already. That would suggest to me that they're probably already... Yeah. Um, o- not okay with, but have realised that they're going to lose one. Planning for. If they're yeah. losing Grant Anderson. Um I've always liked Selwyn as a fullback. Uh, sorry, as a winger. Yeah. He was all right at centre, though. He was all right. Yeah, I think just because you can play centre doesn't mean you should, though. Mm. I, I think like he, he was an elite winger out on that. So right good. Uh, so, yeah, I, 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 you know, I was saying it last year. I would move him back to the wing. Uh, Mariner had a, had a very good season, but there was just times where I felt like he would sort of phase in and out of mm. games. Especially um, defensively, he needed a bit of work. Defensively was the big concern, but I had concerns about Selwyn there defensively as well, so I'm okay with it. I, I think you get more out of playing Selwyn on the wing mm. as a whole. Dean Mariner as a finisher, though. Holy heck, mm. one of the best finishers in the competition. Um, I'm so keen to see Dean Mariner after, under Michael Maguire, just get the best mm. out of him, especially defensively. What do you reckon, Timmy? Yeah, I was pretty vocal last year when the, the sort of touted change of Cobo to centre came up, and I just think he's way better on the wing. And yep. it was like you're changing a good thing for no real mm. reason. I think Cobo sort of, he might have wanted to go to centre, did he, or something, yep. but he's strong, he's fast, you know, he had a few, or still does, a few defensive uh, issues like with his reads and that sort of thing. I just feel like, you know, because he's like a bigger bodied winger, you sort of forget just how freaking quick this bloke is. I think he's made for the wing and then his kick returns as well, his carries, his yardage. I think... You know, I think you force more carries and, and more involvement out of Cobo if you put him on the wing because the game comes to him with kick returns and having to take those tough carries. Mm. Where at centre, you can sort of relax a little bit and wait for the game to come to you. Um, or sort of you have to inject yourself in the game, I should say. And Katoni Staggs is a good example of that. Mm. I think wing's the spot for him. So what, if he does end up back on that wing and Madge gets, you know, Cobo and Staggs coming out of their own end, <sighs> I'm not kicking that fucking goal. Oh, <laughs> miss me Jesus, with that. No way. Um, yeah, it's, it's always interesting in today's game when people are so keen to play centre. I'm like, you get the ball more on the wing. You get like, you get so much opportunity for broken field mm. play. Um, look, I, I get it. Scoots out of your own end when it's the second play. That sucks. Like, because they're just ramming up to jam you. I also get it. The nervousness of crossfield kicks and that. Like, it's an it, it, it's a lot of pressure. 
that centers don't really have to deal with as much. Sometimes I deal with it, but not as much. But I like selling on the wing. And Jesse Arthurs, he's relatively tall too. You know, you got, that means you've got two tall wingers. You can kick to them. Uh, we know Jesse Arthurs at his best. He's really good coming out of his own end. Um, yeah, and I, I think like Dean Mariner, um, I mean, he's pretty good under the high ball too though. And he's also quite strong coming out of his own end. Uh, but yeah, I think Selwyn Cobb on the wing. I like Selwyn Cobb on the wing. If we've got Walsh at fullback, Selwyn on one wing, Jesse Arthurs on the other, Staggs. <laughs> Mariner, who are we leaving out? Well, Oates is gone. Oates is retired, yeah. Um, not really, not really anyone. No one else yeah. major, right? It was like last year it was hard to squeeze everyone in. Yeah. We, especially okay. with Flegler, it was even harder. Um, but I'm pretty sure, like, you've got some of the young fellas, but not, not anyone that's, okay. like, locked in. Um, yeah, it's going to, jeez. Aren't the Broncos one to watch next year under Michael Maguire? Like, it's just going to be so interesting to see a Broncos team under a coach like Michael Maguire. Because, like, I'm trying to think of their, their history. Like, they haven't ever really had... Maybe Anthony Griffin is the closest thing to a Michael Maguire, but obviously, you know, I'd say Michael Maguire has way more runs on the board. Uh, but, yeah, going to be interesting. Very, very interesting. Um, all righty, Beaks Bag from Bailey Monan. Uh, make sure to give Matt at blokeinabar.com... Uh, an email and also thank you to all the the djs and the producers that emailed i've literally gone through all of them and listened to all your music thank you so much for emailing we'll um we'll get back to you as, as soon as we can uh but yeah some of the music outstanding outstanding music all righty beaks bag who was a player that played at your club but no one really talked about mine is eto nabuli at the dragons eto nabuli at the dragons um one that I played with him at the Broncos, and he was a gun. And it just, for some reason, he went to another sport. But Beric Barnes. Oh. Beric Barnes with the headgear. He was so good. He was the next big thing. The next big thing. Um, yeah, and for whatever reason, he ended up going to Union. I think he actually ended up retiring because of head knocks, I think. Yeah, right. Um, but Beric Barnes was a gun. You go. Who you got from the Raiders? Oh, plenty. Just going through the list of all the, the greats to, to don the lime green. And number, number one would probably have to be the Samoan ghost, Daniel Vito. <laughs> <laughs> the great Vito. Now doing great things in uh, the Worldwide Wrestling Federation. Uh, that McMahon documentary is yeah. so good. Oh, my God. You've got to watch it. Not, not to say he wasn't appreciated because he was and putting obvious uh, super coach start on the side, but Bronson Harrison was one that I always loved with the Rage. I think he played three seasons with us. Just such... He was a massive worker, had mm. one of the best offload games I've seen in rugby league. I love Bronson Harrison. Came from the Tigers to the Raiders and, uh, yeah, big Bronson Harrison, man. Who you got, Maddox? i got three for you. Um, I'll go Andrew Everingham. He was a mm. winger. That he, he ended up going to Japanese rugby, I'm pretty sure. But 2012 is when the Rabbitohs, they made the finals for the second time in my entire life. I was in year 12. He just burst on the scene, scored a bunch of tries. He, he was great. He only stayed around for two seasons. wasn't around for 2014. But, yeah, I loved Andrew Everingham. Uh, Eddie Pettiborn went to the same school as me, <laughs> South Junior. He ran it up like a psycho. He, he hit hard. He was so good. And the third one, a lot – okay, this guy played Origin, so he did get a lot of credit. But not really – you know, he didn't get enough credit. Chris McQueen, he could play pretty much any position that, you know, wasn't directly in the middle. He – his aerial work while playing in the back row was such an underrated asset. In fact, one of the grand final tries where uh, Curious Tommy Arvar scored was actually because Inglis put a kick up, McQueen jumped up, gave it back, blah, blah, blah. Like, he did that all the time. And, yeah, I thought, I thought it was so justified when he got picked for Queensland. So, yeah, th those three from the Rabbitohs for me. Root, pick a team for me. Oh, Knights. Yeah. Knights? Newcastle Knights. I'm going to go for... Scotty Jura. Oh, Scotty yes. Jura. The field goal king. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, Tigers. Uh, Tiger. Oh, Owen Craigie. Thanks for coming. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Ra Roosters. Um, I'm going to go for Sam Parrott. Oh, he was so good, Parrott. Very underappreciated. He was so underrated. He was like tackle break king. Mm, yeah. So strong. Went to doggies. Yeah. Wing okay, fullback yeah. anywhere. Um, Sharkies. Sharkies. Um, I'm going to go for... What was that little fullback's name? It was Lightning Quick. 
Oh, uh, yeah. Nathan Gardner. 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 Oh, Remember that length of the field try scored against oh, the Roosters? Oh, man. Yeah. That, that was everywhere. That was yeah. everywhere. Sammy Perrett fullback for the Dogs in the 2014 Grand Final. No yeah. way. Yeah. He was so such a great call. Like, yeah, that's a great call. I appreciate call. his whole career. But by anyone except the own fans, like yeah. anyone who had had um, and Steve Turner was similar for the doggies, yeah. just like so reliable. Yeah. Sam Parrott, Corey Corey Thompson, at Sam, the dogs. Sam Parrott, best um, Mad Monday costume all time when he came dressed as the Rock. Yes, <laughs> that was great unreal. bloke too, Parrott. Great bloke as well. Let us know in the comment section, guys. Most uh, your favourite player that doesn't get uh, talked about that much. And also, don't forget Aussie footy shorts. There are just a few of these left, guys. Bloke Aussie footy shorts, not many left. Go to Aussie footy shorts uh, Instagram or their website. Grab them. They are footy shorts with pockets. They're the highest quality in the country. They're the best in the country. And if you don't want the bloke footy shorts, there are thousands of other designs that you can choose from. So make sure to go to Aussie footy shorts and uh, grab some footy shorts today. Alrighty, use code DMP for 10% off, or you can buy that with a sub subscription for 20% off at begoodhealth.com.au. That's right, good day, the best multivitamin in the business. We all use it, guys. It is so convenient. And get around the boys. It's, it's a really, really good um, multivitamin. And I tell you what, when it comes to your immune system, but also just your mood as well, like, other things that used to like you, you have to take it over a period of time so if you take it for a month or two like other little things that used to fully stress you out you just kind of you still get stressed out a little bit but nowhere near as much as all these benefits of taking a multivitamin every single day and good day is uh the best in the business so go to begoodhealth.com.au use code dmp for 10 percent off and as i said i take it religiously guys so make sure to use 10 percent uh, dmp for 10 percent off subscribe you get 20 percent off all righty what is more, actually, sorry, the Dragons. Kyle Flanagan has reportedly put on 10 keggers, 10 kilos. Shane Flanagan has said Tyrell Stone has put on about eight kilos. Lockie Elias has officially signed and says he hasn't put too much thought into the pressure of replacing Ben Hunt. Geez, I'm interested to see this, this pairing. 10 kilos is a lot of weight, holy. Um, look, I think that the good thing for Kyle Flanagan is, is that, um, and I say this respectfully, but it's not like he's the most explosive athlete. So sometimes when you put all that weight on, the worry is that you'll, you'll get slower, you'll get soft tissue damage, all that kind of stuff. But the good thing for Flanagan is his best asset is his mind in rugby league. It's all about getting a team around the park, he's kicking, he's ball playing. And so if anything, it's just gonna make his defense better. Um, so I love to see this. I'm, I'm genuinely excited to see what Flanagan has in mind. And I'll tell you another little shout, we actually got a text from a massive Rabbitohs fan. And I'm surprised you didn't bring it up, Matty. Lockie Elias actually came through the grades as a six, and Blake Taff was the seven. Yeah, he won a New South Wales Cup premiership at five eight. Yeah. yeah, and so I didn't know that. And so yeah. all of a sudden, like I start to go, like maybe if anything, he was being played incorrectly at seven for the Rabbitohs, and he should have been a six. Because I go back to all these games, and I, I actually still think his his kicking game has improved quite a lot. Um, and I think it's an okay, kicking, a decent kicking game, Lockie Elias by the end. But sometimes I would watch games with Elias at seven and be like. How can't he just like, just lead the boys around? Like he, he seems like it, that should suit him. And then finding out that he actually came through as a six, all of a sudden it all started to click in and make sense that they were trying to force a six to be a seven. And all of a sudden I go, maybe this partnership can work. I, like not necessarily win a comp at this stage, but maybe it can do a lot better than what we thought. I think they will do better than what mm. we all think. Yeah, I like it. Uh, good to see Fano, you know, as you said, mate, I don't like. I don't think attacking-wise that'll impact him all that much. I think defensively, um, it'll be a positive. But but I really like the way the spine's coming together. When you got Damien Cook and Jacob Little who will jump in at sort of nine thirteen, however that's going to look, Flano at halfback. That's what he did last year, and he you know pl played it at at a reasonably high click. He wasn't a superstar, but you're not paying him superstar money. No, you've, you're you're paying your superstar money elsewhere in your fullback role, Val Holmes and whatnot. I. <clears throat> I'm not tipping them to make the top eight, but I think they're destined for like 9, 10, 11, sort of around that mark, the Dragons. How much more exciting are they to come to now as well? Yeah. Like recruitment all of a sudden has gone from extremely difficult to easy is the wrong word, but I tell you what, there's a lot more people that are willing to go to the Dragons now than a couple of years ago. For sure. Yeah, sometimes I, I don't love like when these speeds of the game and the smaller bodies put on too, too much weight because it can take away that explosive nature. But Tyrell Sloan with Clint Gutherson signing, I think the reality is, barring injury to Gutherson, he's probably playing for a wing spot early on mm. and just going to have to make more one-on-one -on -one tackles out there and stopping some of the biggest, most damaging finishes in the game at his size with his, you know, defensive deficiencies, 
he had to put on a bit of weight there. Mm. So good thing for him and yeah, we'll see. Yeah, it's uh, what I like about Sloan, Sloan on the wing too, it'll, it'll just force him to do a lot of the stuff that you could tell he probably didn't enjoy as much at fullback. Mm. And when you're at fullback, because he is a relatively good ball player at fullback, uh, um, Tyrell Sloan, you could kind of excuse some of the other stuff by going, okay, well, you know, he has, you know, two line breaks a game and here's a couple try assists. Whereas what I like about him on the wing, it's like, mate, you've got to take those t- tough carries. Like you've, and you've got to make that one-on-one tackle. There's really, there's no kind of like at fullback, for example, let's say someone makes a line break and you know, he kind of misses the tackle or whatever. You can always kind of go, well, they shouldn't have made the line break in the first place. Um, whereas on the wing, there's none of that. It's like, mate, you just have to make the tackle. I actually, Funnily enough, I said last year that maybe they should consider putting him on the wing just for this exact reason of like, well, I know that they've been forced to with Guthrie coming to the club, but just to force him to, to almost just get himself into the game, get him doing things that he may not enjoy as much because sometimes you never know. Like he could, he's actually quite, he's, I think he's, six, he's at least six foot, maybe even six foot one. He's actually got a relatively, not a, it's not a huge frame, but it's not a small frame at all either. Sometimes situations like this, bring the best out in you being playing in a position that you don't want to play um and i think that might be what sloan needs right now i really do because again the the problem with him at fullback was is that every time that you got to the point where you're like oh i just don't know whether he's a first grade fullback he'd do something great yeah like and you just be like well fuck how do you drop this bloke you just got three tries just whatever well you just mentioned that guy's being forced to play a position they don't want to play guy at the dragons had to play on the wing last year hasn't turned out too bad for him it hasn't turned bad at all um (laughs) Isn't it, yeah, yeah, fucking bizarre. I was just about to say, just back to the Moses situation, mm. isn't it funny how, like, playing out of position, geez, like, players, sometimes they're just so keen on playing that position that it almost doesn't make sense. And, like, the Lomax thing is a really good example of that. Like, he just didn't want to play wing. I know he still, he was okay with it. And he becomes the best winger, arguably, in the comp, outside of Bizarre, plays for his country, but still wants to play in the centres. And I think it just alludes back to what we were talking about earlier of like with Moser of like, you, you're outside looking in, you know, you, your points are all really valid. Like, mate, you're young, you know, you, you're going to play first grade for a very long time. But sometimes footy players, they're so blinded at what they want. And I was guilty of it too. I, as I said, my biggest regret in my career is patience, is patience. Um, and so you look at Sloan, you look at Lomax, but you look at Sloan and maybe this is, maybe this is what his career needed from the get-go, who, who knows? Um, and maybe with Sloan, to your point, Timmy, is he spends time developing his game on the wing, which is less pressure on fullback, and then by the time that fullback role becomes available, kind of like Hunt and Moser, he's an even better player and he just slots straight back in there. Uh, because some, I, th- I do think something needs to happen with the Sloan situation. Yeah, for sure. Like something needs to happen. Yeah. Something needs to give. It, yeah. the, the circuit breaking it because the talent's there. It's just about. Um, I'd be, I'd be, and, and who knows? Like two years at fullback might be okay. Gutho, you know, by that that third year of his contract, maybe Gutho moves to six or a different position or whatever, and then Sloan moves back to fullback. Because I tell you what, a Sloan with the ball running of a quality NRL winger, and he's quality ball playing at fullback, that's a scary fullback. The potential of Tyrell Sloan is best fullback in the NRL in five years' time. The reality of Tyrell Sloan is fringe first grader at the moment. Yeah. That's where he's at. It's crazy. But they had that, that's, that shows you his talent. Yes. Like the talent is sure. crazy. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm really interested to see... I'm also really excited for Lockie Elias because maybe this whole time he's been going, mate, I'm not a seven. I'm not a seven. Like imagine being at a club that's as big as the Rabbitohs. Mm. You didn't come through the grades playing six. Everyone's bagging you for playing seven and you're going, bro, I'm a six. I'm a six. And you have to step into the shoes of, you know, one of the one of the best traditional sevens I've ever seen, Adam Reynolds. Mm. Tough yep. gig. Yeah, tough gig. And also you're never going to take Cody Walker's jersey either. Um, so, yeah, I'm really interested to see what happens there. Really interested. Uh, speaking of uh, the Rabbitohs, oh, sorry, Got a question for you, boys. And we spoke about this, I think, two years ago. Quite a while ago, this came up. What is more impressive, Panthers four in a row or Queensland eight in a row? Now, I think it was two years ago this question was asked, and I was very firmly in the camp. Eight in a row is better than back-to-back. Maybe it was a year. and And I could even go as far as saying eight in a row is better than three. But I'm I'm fifty fifty not fifty fifty maybe I'm sixty forty on that like I think I'm, it was three was it three it. Yeah, okay three, it 
I, I'm, I'm happy to say eight in a row is harder. Four in a row, though, I think that tops eight in a row. I think it, I think it tops it. Yeah, I think it tops it without a doubt. Uh, throwing the salary cap and everything, like, I, yeah, I think it has to be four in a row. Just like four, like, think about how many things can go wrong in a season. How many things can go wrong in just one game? And not only have they won four in a row, they've been in the top two the whole time. Timmy? Yeah, I thought three in a row uh, was more was harder to do and more impressive. Like, and the reality is that hadn't happened since the early 80s with Parramatta. Roosters' first team since 92, 93 to do it twice. So to do it three times in a row, let alone four, for a number of different reasons. Queensland are beating one team. The Panthers, and they have to do it, need to win two games a year. They play three a year. The Panthers, they're beating sort of 15, 16 teams. They have to do it across 30-odd games of a season. They're the hunted every year, which is why going back-to-back is so hard. And then you touched on a guru. The Panthers are doing this with a salary cap, which is designed to stop this stuff happening. Queensland, they just picked the best that's available. And what they had for that eight in a row was the greatest rugby league team of all time. So I, I think Penrith for sure. Can I, can I spice it up for you a little bit? And I know people hate hypotheticals, but let's just ignore that for a second. What if Queensland won 14 and they won 12 in a row? Would it still be Panthers four in a row? I think 12 in a row. Because they won 11 of 12. So they still, they went incredibly close. I think 12 in a row, just because it's like never been done before. Mm. That, the, the reason why you could argue the back-to-back or three in a row isn't as good as the eight in a row is because a team has done that before. Granted, I know it's not the salary cap era. Mm. Um, whereas the Queensland eight in a row, it's just like the closest that anyone had ever gotten to that was, was it three in a row? Three, yep. So the, the most ever one in a row before that was three, they went eight. If it was 12, like, <laughs> but yeah, four in a row, I think four in a row cements it. I think that is more of an achievement than the eight in a row. A 12 in a row is a tough one. I'm sort of on the fence to be honest with you. Yeah. V the four. Yeah. No. Four in a row. Four in a row will never happen again. No, I'm saying I'm on the. I, I think they're like it, the, the the Queensland twelve in a row. I, I personally think Penrith four premierships definitely better than the eight in a row. Mm. The twelve in a row, his hypothetical that becomes a little mm. bit more interesting. I, I think twelve in a row v four in a row. I'm still hundred percent the four in a row. Twelve in a row versus three in a row. That's where I'm like that's tough. But the, okay. I guess what about this though from a mathematical standpoint? So clubs. So in the NRL era, clubs have done two in a, like back to back. Mm. So four in a row is two times that. Twelve in a row is four times the be- the next best. Four times the next best. Yeah, I, I know. Again, they're beating one team. Yeah, but it's all within context. So so was all, the New South Wales teams that mm. only had won three in a row were beating one team. Mm. So it's all relative to each other. Yeah. Um, that's where I go. I probably lean toward twelve in a row. Whereas um, eight in a row, I, I do think the four in a row is um, is better. I just think that like the amount of things that can go wrong in a season, and I think also what adds to the the this um, spectacle of it all is they stayed in the top two every year. Mm, yeah. Like they didn't they didn't have a shit year and finish eighth and then just have this crazy run towards the end of the year and win it. Like they have essentially been the team to beat since 2020, the year before. Like it's it's five grand finals in a row. So so for for five years, essentially they've been the team to beat. And, and that's the other thing. Like if you off the top of the melon here, but if you had added all the Panthers finals games together in that four years, you could almost throw in the grand final. I think they've before. only lost one. One. That's what I mean. They lost one game like the Maroons playing, what, three games a year. They, they, lost, they watched them once. They watched them once. Watched them once. So they lost games every series. So if you're getting mathematically in that sense as well, that just makes Penrith even more outstanding. Mm. It's incredible. All incredible. I will say is thank Christ for Trent Hodkinson so that we don't have to have a real conversation about this. <sighs> Could you imagine 12 in a row? No, I couldn't. That's sickening. I don't want to. Oh, holy <laughs> shit. Um, let us know in the comments section, four in a row or eight in a row. I, I think it's pretty, as I said, when it was three in a row, I kind of could lean towards the eight in a row. Um, and maybe I'm Queenslander, so I'm biased. I don't know. But I think four is like, lock it in. I think yeah. it's the greatest achievement in rugby league history. It is just insane. I just ran my eye over it very quickly. How many players do you reckon from the 2006 Queensland squad were there in 2013? Actually, 2014 I went to, to be fair, the next team that lost. How many, how many do you reckon featured in both? Uh, six? Yeah, five of them. Five, I was going to say five. Fuck. Yeah, Hodges, Thurston, Cam Smith, 
Uh, and I think the other one, Sam Dido. There was one more in there. The somewhere. real talking point of this is that the dynasty, and this is often I've looked, started with David Stagg in the back row. So <laughs> that, like, tells the story. <laughs> um, all righty, guys. The GOAT, Tane Mill, has left <laughs> the Rabbitohs. Uh, he signed a two-year deal with Huddersfield Giants. Man, I don't have to Mill. He, look, yeah, okay, did he take people's heads off and get Simbin all the time? Yeah, he did. But we love that. That's fun to watch. Like, obviously... You know, I, everyone that he heard, I hope's okay, which they are. <laughs> uh, um, but geez, it was entertaining to watch him from a from a uh, a neutral person, a neutral fan. He's off to the hardest fields giants. Yeah, I'm devastated. I love watching Tane. If I, <laughs> You're I, a big Tane. I love guy. Tane. He's a good player. He's, he's got some screws loose, but you have to be to play rugby mm. league. He's probably got some of his games are like individual, like efforts and that have been outstanding. Bro, this was top- this was easily his best season. He topped not the even league close. for offloads. Yeah. Well, that's <laughs> mental. And in my opinion, he's playing out of position. Like, he can play Tane. He's just, he's probably just gone one too many brain explosions. I would have loved to have seen Wade Bennett get a season with yeah. him. Just, yeah. cut, just bring him off the bench. I've been saying for ages, like, bring him off the bench, jersey 17, put him out there for 30 minutes a game, let him have enough impact on the game, but not enough time to fucking do something wild. Yeah. And take him back off the field. I, <laughs> I think there's a place for Tane. I love my favourite thing, I'm not sure if you saw the uh, Huddersfield Giants, they uploaded their post saying, uh, Golden Boot nominee. Oh, fucking oh, love. Oh, that's great. That is great. That I is cannot great. believe he had the most offloads this year. I did not know that. How many games did he play? 21, 21 games, 62 offloads. So in second was Angus Crichton, played 23 games. Yeah. Third, Kiraz played 25 games. So, great. yeah, that's unreal. <clears throat> Guru, he did play one year under Wayne Bennett. He played 10 games in 2021. Didn't lose a single game. There you go. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, that's great. Um, It would have been good to see him under Wayne, though. He's he's a play... As I said, like, he comes in. He'll have games where, like, two try assists, two tries. Like, kills it. Um, You know, Tane, I think it was... When he got sacked by the Tigers, he hand-wrote a letter to the Warriors coach asking just for an opportunity just show up there and just maybe show what he could do. Mm. Like, yeah, the, the, there's a lot of negatives you can point out about Tane if you want, but there's, fuck, there's, there's, there's been some positive things in there too. Absolutely. All righty, Jack Bird has spent the preseason training at Locke. He says that's where Benji wants to use him in 25. Uh, he, Royce Hunt and Skelton all cut their breaks short to start preseason. Um, and oh, don't forget, guys, Grumpy Coffee, we are back. Our beans are back and our pods are back. You go to grumpycoffee.com.au. Turn that frown upside down. The best coffee in all the land. The best blend in all the land. So make sure to check it out. It's a beautiful, beautiful coffee. We actually have freaking run out. When I say we had sold out of the pods, we literally have no pods here right now. So we've got to get, got to get some down to this studio. Um, in regards to Jack Bird at Locke, what I like about this is that the Tigers have gone, all right, this is your position, Jack Bird. Whole preseason, play there. Um, I don't mind it. As long as he has a whole preseason there, he can get his body in the right shape for it. He can get his mindset. The training can be correct. Um, I probably would have put him out in the centres. However, in today's modern game, um, with uh, 13s being smaller, and Jack Bird's actually not that small, get him with a bit of ball playing. We know he's played a bit of six. I don't mind it. I don't mind it. I like it. Uh, my only concern is his body and how it's going to hold up there. If you could guarantee me Jack Bird plays 20 games this year, i pick him at lock. I think it is his best position. Um, and him coming through in the juniors, he was like best 5'8", halfback, centre, lock, second row, fullback. Just whatever fucking jersey you happen to throw him at, he'll be the best. He would have been about around your age, wouldn't he, or not? Was he A couple years younger. A couple years younger, yeah. He was a freak. Um, I, I think 13 is his best position. I just have... Serious concerns whether his body's going to be able to hold up mm. playing third mm. He, um, <clears throat> yeah, I prefer him on the edge, whether that's back row on the edge or you know at centre. But like, it does excite me for the reason that the Tigers are just it's almost concerning that re- for a team that's recruited so well, mm. particularly over the last twelve months, they just haven't been able to find a person to fill in that lock role and the, mm. man, the man for it now we don't know yeah. if Jack Bird's going to be that mm. man but he fits that bill mm. of the modern day lock forward an, an agile sort of smaller body number 13 you know he said he's, he's played enough 5'8 he'll have the ball playing sorted <clears throat> he's adapting to a new role I think it can work I said it's very exciting not what I would have done with him but I can't wait to see what it produces yeah if you get Jack Bird at his best playing lock for the Tigers mm. 
I'll sit down, have a beer with Richo and talk about the best spines. <laughs> <laughs> it could be a little needle. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, I, I think that the only, the only, when you talk about actually the, how, how he actually plays rugby league, is sometimes birdie so off the cuff, it's hard to, to build structure around him. And so that's why it's really important if you're going to play him 13, you got to train him the whole preseason so that he yeah. knows where to be. He's not taking hit ups just because the problem is sometimes if you put Bird in 13, he'll just take 25 hit ups. Like, because he's just so keen to get involved in the game. And I think if you can just give him a bit of some rails to kind of play on, not, not too much. You don't want to take away, you know, what he brings, which is that kind of off the cuff footy, but just enough rails to kind of get the team around and give their forward pack a point of difference, you know. Granted, like I agree with you, as, as long as his body holds up, and I think you've just got to work under the assumption that it will. You've just yep. got to work that. So if they can do that, I think he'd be a damaging 13. And that's where I think, you know, Jack Bird, he can go a little bit rogue and whatnot, which is what you want him to do as well, because that's what he's good at. Like, that's what I always thought sort of was one of John Bateman's strengths. And I think mm. they sort of struggled to put him on the right rails and mm. how to utilise him. So I do have concerns about that. But once again, you've won three spoons in a row. I think Loxie's best position. And we'll just, what their forward pack just lacked so much like latitude movement. Like yep. you watch the Tigers sometimes and it was just like hit up, hit up. Hit, like there was no movement around the ruck. There was no connecting each side. And so with Bird, as long as you can just make sure that most of his carries, are, he's doing a job for someone else then I think it can work because you, you don't want to fully take away his off the cuff footy because that's what is going to break games open at some stages. Mm. Um, yeah, yeah, one of the, the most versatile players in the game, premiership winning backline player at centre for the Sharks, can now add starting, possibly starting middle forward to his resume. It's crazy. And far out he can do it all. Yeah, so I'm, I'm excited for that. And, and as I said, like what I like about it as well is you're, you're putting a, like a high quality player in a important spine position and if he plays every week and you can you can build sides around guys like jack bird like even when he's at the dragons whenever he played he's always one of the better players on the field like there's very rarely a game you watch you know he might have a you know a barry crocker once every now and then but most of the time jack bird is one of the better players on the field and so if you can keep him on the field get some railroads just to keep him on track a little bit yeah i like it i like it now I, what i like about it as well is like just the clear direction clear direction they're not going so nothing frustrates me more when I hear stories of like clubs going into preseasons going, oh yeah, we're training him at, at, at 13, but oh, he's doing a bit of work over in the edge and he might play a bit of center. It's yeah. like, bro, if he plays 13 edge or center, his body is completely different That's in all three positions. Um, and so I like that from the, the Tigers. He's played 156 first grade games, eight at fullback, 87 at center, 31 at five, eight, six at halfback, 23 in the second row, 11 at lock, mm. and he's come off the bench nine times. Mm. Take so right. out the bench. Yeah. That's six different positions he's played more than five games in in the NRL. I touched on it last week, but if he plays 20-plus games this season, I mean he's fit for 20-plus games and not injury-affected and come off the bench for 10 minutes, he'll be the value signing of 2025, I reckon. Oh, be huge. Could be huge. All righty, NRL survey. The NRL has recently conducted a survey with all the NRL clubs at the end of the season. It's understood one Sydney club wants to change the try scoring rules so that a try scored from a kick is worth less than a try scored from a pass. Hate it. Hate it, stupid. <clears throat> Hate it. I wanna, you know, I wanna go through the stats and see which club got the most try scored on them by kicks. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm gonna be like, that's found ya, found ya. Um, I will say it does bring up a bit of a broader conversation though of are we giving too much power to the kickers of our game because we can't put any pressure on them? Yeah, yeah, it's fair. So I, like, I also look, and I've said it a number of times on here, like, I fucking hate this seven tackle set when you kick a ball dead from mm. 10 metres out mm. or whatever. Like, I think you're also taking a lot of power away from kickers in that regard. But you're right, you can't put pressure on guys anymore. Like, and also, it's so, like, one week, if you even touch the kicker, it's a penalty. <laughs> The next week, blokes are driving kickers into the ground and they're like, oh, yeah, they didn't, they didn't lose contact. They kept them in. Mm. Which one is it? It's yeah. either you can't make contact or you're allowed to, you must hold on all the way to the deck. Um, what do you reckon? Are we giving too much power to the kickers, Timmy? Um, oh, <clears throat> possibly, but mm. you said in terms of because we're looking after kickers and injuries and that sort of stuff, it's not going to change, so mm. get used to it. I, I think there the concept of changing that is stupid. I will throw another one in the ring, though. And it'd be probably a little bit controversial, but 
I've said for a while, and I, it's not often that I praise Union for something over rugby league, but I love five points for a try, two points for a penalty goal. Uh, or conversion. I just think it promotes more attacking football. And I think one example of that would be, you know, you get excited for the start of a game or an origin game. There's that first set, penalty downfield, penalty, and like everyone's up and about and excited. The players are G'd up and then they take a penalty from 10 out in front for the two, as every team should. And it takes two minutes to set it up, another 45 seconds to get down there, kick off. It's three minutes of just taking the energy out of the game. I think the fact that it's worth half a try, and I've always thought this, I just don't think it rewards, you know, playing football and, and, and using the footy in attacking positions and doing all that enough. Mm. Uh, I, th- I would love to see it five for a try, two for a goal. It'd just make the product, it'd, it'd, there'd be tenfold more ball in play. And don't get me wrong, there's things that come off the back of this, like, you know, fatigue, the amounts of that, because players are getting less rest. So maybe there's other little tweaks. I think five and two would be fantastic because the game is about running the football and hits and scoring tries. In my eyes, it's not about kicking goals. Big part of the game, but I want to see the ball being run. Yeah, Root, wow. you like, you're smoking. I don't mind it. Okay. I, see, I definitely see where you're coming from. I, don't, I just don't know if we, got, we have a problem of the ball not being in play enough. Mm. I, think, I think that although logically it makes sense, I don't, I don't watch a game and go, oh, geez, we're kicking the ball too much. Mm. That's, uh, so That's I don't yeah. want to change that. like even though on paper it you know it would potentially be better I just think that I don't watch the game and go are oh, we kicking too much what I would say is like at the end of a game I don't like drop goals deciding a game mm. that's one thing mm. I don't like um, but you actually like drop goals don't you deciding the game you don't mind it yeah I don't mind it yeah I don't like it um, I'm not saying there needs to be urgent change and this needs to be done but I think Five for try, two for goal. I think the game is in a better place and it's a better product. I think Kempi does bring up a valid point, though, that it's probably not broken enough to fix it. Yeah, like as in... Like, no, no, it's, no, it's, yeah, it's not. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I do think the game will be better, though. Mm. Always have. Yeah, I, I think the... Fuck, you couldn't get the... If you had the ball more in play, Jesus. On the flip side, just because I feel bad about uh, rapping rugby union... <laughs> Three points for a penalty goal in Union is the stupidest thing. Oh man, don't even get me started. Do, and that is like half destroyed Union in Australia, among yeah. other things. But uh, no, the five and two, I think that's the balance. Yeah, okay, fair enough, fair enough. Um, All righty, uh, Australia versus India this week, boys. We need a brought to you by Sportsbet. Give us a follow on the feed, guys. We need a first innings top run scorer and a first innings top wicket taker from either team. And I forgot to put in there a result as well. So Australia draw India. Australia to win. Marnus is just going to have an absolute blinder and Paddy Cummins is going to come out and absolutely kill it. So Paddy Cummins for the top wicket taker and top run scorer is going to be Marnus, of course. I'm going to take Travis Head for top run scorer. And what else do I need? Top wickets? Yep. Um, I will take Stark. Who wins? Uh, Australia win. Australia win. Uzi Kawaja, he'll turn up. And then, again, feel dirty saying it, but Jasper Boomer's a freak, so top wickets. Hammy's gone Australia head Boomer. I'm going Australia head Cummins. So that's it. Sweet. Wow. Anything else going on, boys? Mate, Cricketers Playbook podcast. Yeah? General cricket podcast, first of the summer last week. It almost uh, brought YouTube to a standstill. The numbers were huge. <laughs> you broke um, the internet? But yes, the SC Playbook cricket content for the season. So separate channels to the SC Playbook Rugby League. Mm. So Twitter, X, whatever you call it, Facebook, TikTok, Insta, jumps on there. But yeah, the, the general cricket podcast for the summer, up and about. There you go. Uh, and also quickly, it just wasn't on here. Ben Hunt has alluded to potentially retiring from Origin. What do you reckon, boys? Do you reckon it might be time for Benny? I, I, me personally, I think that if, I, if I'm from a legacy perspective, Ben Hunt, I reckon go now. Because like right now, Ben Hunt in origin is remembered like mm. just an incredible, an incredible um, uh, legacy in origin. Like he's had these crazy moments. Um, yeah, I, I, I'd be looking at it going, you know what? I've had a good run. I'm getting to the back end of my career. And this has nothing to do with the fact that he's at the Broncos and I want him to focus on that at all. And more, if the fact that he's even thinking about it, I reckon just go, yep, Dunskis. I look at this from a New South Wales perspective, obviously, and I don't know what scares me more, Ben Hunt in 14 or Tom Dearden in 14. Yeah, I was going to say, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be picking him next year anyway, mm. to be honest. 
Like I wouldn't even. I'd be going Dearden. I'd be thinking about Pong. Like there's, yeah, he's he's a bit too far down for me. Yeah, I I think Ben Hunt, if I was Ben Hunt, I'd be having a conversation with Billy Slater Mm. and saying, like Mal had the the blueprint there with the Kangaroos with Harry Green at the nine and Ruben Cotter being able to slot in for that 15 Mm. odd minutes. If, If Harry does need a break, which extremely fit, maybe does, maybe doesn't. He probably doesn't. Uh, but there is cover there. So, and I think if Billy's sort of saying, yeah, look, I, I, I'm open to the idea of doing that. But if he chats to Billy and Billy says, no, mate, I want you there and I want you to be sharing that role with Harry again, I think that would probably sway the decision. Mm. But that if, if Billy was just go, no, no, I think the Cotter Harry can work, that could lead into the retirement mm. call. See, because this is his quote. He's, he said, I'm not too sure. If he was asked, his 2025 could be his last origin. He said, at some stage, I'll have to make a decision about origin. Right now, I want to get into next year, have a fresh start um, at the Broncos and see how the start of the season is going, and that will take care of origin level. See, I don't know whether he's saying, like, look, you know, maybe I'll get selected, maybe I won't. But if it, if, again, I'm not sure if he's saying this, but if he's saying, look, I'm not even sure if I'll play this year, I reckon just, you go, mate, what a career. Mm-hmm. There's other guys coming through. It's mm-hmm. been set up. You've got Deard and you've got Kay, Kay, Kalen Ponger, if Reese Walsh is fullback, mm-hmm. that could also go at 14 if that works. Um, yeah, I, I reckon, I reckon you, you're better off just ending it in your own terms than getting to Origin and Deard and gets put at 14. Yeah, yeah. Quick hypothetical, if he was to retire from Origin footy, and let's say Harry Grant's unavailable game one, what would Queensland do then, do you reckon? Do you pick Cotter there? Do, you, do they bring in a Reid? They... Probably bring in a Reid, I'd say. Yeah? Yeah, I reckon you'd bring in a Reid and, and um, have Cotter. Is there as... anyone else? There really isn't, is there? Um, Can't be a pick Blake Moser. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah, we well, wouldn't get picked because he'd be fucking playing local league. Timmy's got him playing local league and telling him to shut his mouth. Straight out of Queensland Cup. <laughs> Timmy's got him playing local league, saying, "Mate, shut your mouth. You're 28 years old. You're not ready for first grade." <laughs> oh, that's great. Um, yeah, look, I, I think that you just I laid go. You up for that one. Yeah, I know. Thanks, <laughs> mate. <laughs> we'll try, sis, to finish the line. Oh, that's great. Um, I, yeah, I think that if you, I'm in an ring, I think Dearden's ready to go. Get yet Dearden in that. Uh, like, who's to say Munster's? I mean, that would be a problem if Munster was injured. Mm. And then you, you Dearden at 14 is tough because he's obviously going to have to play six. It just shows you an origin. You lose one or two players, like it fucking can just smash you. Yeah, it can smash you. Because what do you, what do you do if you're Queensland? Let's say Ben Hunt goes, I'm I'm done, and then as you said, Harry Grant gets injured. Well, you're bringing in Reed. <sighs> you just you genuinely. Oh, I mean, you probably pick Reed Marty, but it's funny you nearly send an SOS to Ben Hunt. Yeah, yeah, you send that, and that's and also Ben Hunt yeah. has been Queensland's secret weapon for like four or five years. Like, how often have you guys looked at your bench and gone, oh, I don't know what to do, I don't know what to do, whereas. Queensland have always had this added luxury yeah. of a half. You know what? There. If he chats to Billy Slater about it and he was thinking about it, if you're Billy, you're saying, mate, I get it, but as we just said, if Harry goes down, you're our man, yeah. so don't retire. Don't retire. Yeah. Yeah. That's a that's a good point. But in saying that, like if you're Benny, are you going, Well, you know, I, I want to go out my own terms. Yeah. What if I don't want to get to origin, Harry isn't injured, and I don't get selected and then I retire. All that being said, Reid Marnie do a good job. He tackle his ass yeah. off. His service is great. Yeah. He, he'd be okay. Yeah. So who's the other one that I think will be putting massive pressure on him? He said Tom Dearden, obviously. Like, I can come midway through the season. Max Plath, I reckon he'll be pushing for that four. Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah. Psycho Plath, love that. Um, geez, Queensland's just a, a bit of an interesting spot. You look at DCE's age. Mm. You look at Benny Hunt's age. You know, Munster's not getting any younger. And all of a sudden, you know, Dearden might be the main man within, I'd say, would you say it's definitely DC's last year? Not definitely, but you know what I mean? Like 80%, Pro- probably. 90%. I'd probably. say 90% likely it's DC's mm-hmm. last year. And so Dearden's the man, next man up. But let's say Munster retires in a year or two too. All of a sudden it's Munster Walker probably. I think I said it was Chez's last year in 2019. Yeah. <laughs> um, Freak. And th- they've just been blessed with these key players and key positions for a few years now, but they're getting to the point now where they have to move on. And it's all of a sudden, now it's, it's the Blues with this experienced spine and it's Queensland with this inexperienced spine. Because like there's a, there's a world where two years' time, obviously Harry Grant would be there, but let's say Harry Grant was injured. You, you could be going into a game with Marnie, Deard and Walker, um, maybe Walsh or Ponga. Mm. Very different to obviously DCE. Like yeah. Going into a game with DCE and Munster at six and seven, even if they're out of form, is like, it's a blessing. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
So we'll see. We'll see. Anyway, as, as I said, guys, uh, grab some grumpy coffee from our website. The pods are back. The beans are back. Um, anything else, boys? I got some merch dropping Tuesday night. Uh, hats for for your Santa sacks with, and some new Guru Steedens as well. Sweet. And also six PM tonight, New South Wales time. One of our biggest drops ever. Make sure to be there uh, because you won't want to miss it. Trust me. Trust me. Best Chrissy present ever for yourself or your partner can get it for you. Uh, that's going to be at Bloke Dot Shop, six PM, New South Wales time. Cannot wait. Uh, be there and expect our texts and also. Um, uh, be there for the uh, Instagram at 6pm because we've got a nice little video for you. A nice little <laughs> video for you. And as usual, we'll go and fuck ourselves. Thank you. What are you really gambling with? For free and confidential support, call the number on the screen or visit the website.